After they ruined Terminator, now comes the time for Bond. You endure for three hours all the woke you can get, and then it ends in the lamest possible way. Not only an insult to all the Bond films and Bond fans ever, and Ian Fleming, but just the plain lame resolution to whatever the conflict was, which by the way, is not clear at any time, not that we care. It was certainly not worth the wait. This is not what you buy a ticket to Bond for. We should forget that this movie exists. It is inherently bad. Even if you choose to ignore, this isn't a real Bond movie. Even the action sequence is lame. Oh, here's a mean Land Rover Defender. Ooh, it's a crash at the first bottle. Here's another one. Ooh, it's a crash. You don't go. It will undoubtedly ruin your day and probably the whole decade. Now that cancel culture is so fashionable, we should cancel this movie! <laughs> should stop at Spectre, or even better, at Sky. Garbage far left rubbish ruins yet another great beloved franchise. Disregard the positive reviews, just the Twitter weirdos trying to stay relevant. This movie should never have been made. You don't take an iconic character that has entertained audiences for 60 years and kill him off for the sake of political correctness. His character was emasculated and left to die for nothing more than to satisfy the Me Too movement. Hollywood has gone too far. There is no denying that this film had plenty of action. However, it doesn't justify what they did to the greatest spy that ever lived. They destroy his will to live by making sure he could never see his daughter and her mother ever again. Making Q gay? Really? I hope this movie fails. It is a slap in the face to all the Bond loyalists around the world. Star Wars was destroyed in the same manner for similar reasons. I am so sick of what Hollywood has become and their desire to destroy all that we loved in favor of restarting these iconic movies and characters in their new twisted image. What is this? What is this film? It's not a Bond film. It's not really an action film. They're like a BBC miniseries at times, with some generic gunslinging, shoot some cardboard cutout bad guy scenes chucked in. Bond girls were toned down to the max. Bad guys at who cares? Rivalry with the new 007 lasted about 10 minutes before the characters got bored. We're in the midst of an era where talentless writers with their hands tied behind their backs from woke culture are given the keys to long established franchises. They remove everything that makes characters complex and morally questionable, remove stereotypes. Remove the toxic masculinity, remove femininity, charm and wit, and poof, you have no time to die. I went to the cinema to watch an action spy film and saw a bad drama that didn't tick any of the Bond boxes. Also the 10 out of 10 reviews and the 8 out of 10 on IMDb. What's the point in rating films anymore? This film's better than Rocky, is it? Huh, <laughs> give me a break. Welcome to 2021. Bond is dead can have a toxic white male in 2021, movies are dead, creativity is dead, and actually having a brain seems to be dead as well. Thanks for ruining another classic, because politics are more important than actually making a good film. If I could give zero stars, I would, so the one star is for all those people who simply were forced to do their job on the film. Yes, I mean you, gaffer number three and assistant number four. I never really cared for the Daniel Craig's Bond. Partly his looks, more thuggish than hero, and partly what they've done to the character. Once a good guy with a healthy sex drive, morphed into a vodka-guzzling, egomaniacal psychopath, getting everyone around him killed. This Bond movie was not about anything other than the fascist woke culture getting rid of Bond once and for all. The villain and the plot are just filler. And too much of that. Some of it's senseless. No, this Bond becomes a husband-father figure. And it's all very contrived towards his demise, essentially emasculating the character completely. You'll see that the average reviews vary between like 5 and 7 stars. And that would be the difference between those reviewers who have historical perspective and those who don't. Say goodbye to Bond. Hello to Woke. Well, well, well. This is going to be a fun ride! <laughs> Silence through the night What a thrill I'm searching and I'll melt into you What a fear in my heart But 
but you're so supreme. I give my up in what you could call the golden age of kids spy fiction. I watched a lot of Kim Possible, Codename Kids Next Door, Totally Spies, and of course, International Super Spy. I'm an As a young adult, I have retained a love for the genre, exemplified by films like the Kingsman series and Atomic Blonde. What I enjoy about the genre is that it contains several things I'm interested in. Looking stylish, traveling the world, using espionage and manipulation to destroy my enemies, and having cool technology. But I never watched any of the James Bond movies. I had them all lying around, promising to watch them eventually. I finally saw them in December of 2021, in the midst of a social media break and right as I finished the La La Land video. It was originally going to be an, okay, let's watch this shit and have fun kind of occasion. But as I did research on James Bond, I grew fascinated by his character. He is the epitome of the mid-20th century masculine fantasy. A suave, intelligent womanizer who always saves the day and gets the girl. The early films make it clear that you're supposed to idolize him, and I get the appeal. James Bond is not a person though. To me, he is an archetype that has evolved to changing times and ideals. He was once a man you could look up to and see as cool, but now he's a broken pedestal we have to pick up the pieces for. And after 25 films, I think I can reconstruct what was of cinema's most iconic action hero. To me, he's a phoenix. The mythical bird that lives for a thousand years before burning to ashes, only to rise again and live a new, different life. Many people are asking important questions about James Bond. When did James Bond get so woke? How will the most recent characterization of him shape future interpretations of the character? Who will be James Bond next? First of 
of all, obviously, the next James Bond should be me. But let's take a look at that first question. When did James Bond get so woke? Here's my answer. One, the films were almost always ahead of the curve to some extent, at least for the time they were released. Two, society standards have changed, but you haven't changed with them. Get with the times, you fucking boomer! Now, I must stress that this does not absolve the Bond films of criticism, especially in its treatment of women and minorities. When something problematic pops up, I will absolutely call it out. But historical context is important when dissecting films like these. And also, the books, believe it or not, are even worse. But we'll get to that later. So here is my analysis of the evolution of James Bond in cinema. From escapist fantasy to three-dimensional flawed human, as well as the evolution of the movies themselves. But first... If you're new to my content, I tend to have a set of rules and disclaimers before the meat of my videos, partly for legal reasons and partly to emphasize my creatorial intent. Here are the rules and disclaimers for this video. One, I'm gonna try my best not to spend too much time discussing the plot of each movie. I am not Wikipedia, and the point of the video is to discuss the evolution of a character and a franchise. Two, I will be counting each James Bond era as a different James Bond character. The series proper wasn't rebooted until the Craig era, but for Flo and my sanity, we will be counting each James Bond portrayer as a separate continuity. The one exception is George Lazenby, who will be roped in with Sean Connery for reasons I will explain when we get there. Number three. This is, by all accounts, an opinion piece. You do not have to agree with me. If you actually like Die Another Day, you're wrong, but you're entitled to your opinion. Number four, however, any and all comments antagonizing me or other people will be reported. Please behave yourselves. Number five, once again, do not harass anyone I mention in this video. Please and thank you. And now, on with the show. Before we get to the films, we need to discuss three important people, author Ian Fleming and producers Albert R. Broccoli and Harry Seltzman. Ian Fleming was born on 26 May 1908 to Valentine and Evelyn St. Croix Fleming. He grew up wealthy as Valentine ran a family bank that was so successful it never got bought out or wait, no, it got sold to J.P. Morgan Chase in 2000. Oops. But Valentine was many other things aside from a banker. He was a rich man, a Scottish conservative, and a general who was killed in World War I. Personality and interest-wise, he seemed to be the perfect idea for a secret agent in the 20th century. Very daring, very athletic, enjoyed a number of things that James Bond would later enjoy, particularly nice cars and hot women. He even went to the elite Sandhurst Military Academy, where he was quietly expelled due to contracting gonorrhea. I'm not kidding, look it up! So instead, he became a journalist, and he was apparently damn good at it. He covered the Metro Vix trial in 1933, where he tried to secure an interview with Stalin, which sadly did not happen, and flexed on rival journalists by partaking in some rather unethical activities. Invited to watch the trial from the press benches, Fleming scooped his rival journalist by dropping his reports from the window of the upstairs courtroom to a boy standing below in the freezing cold who hurried them to the nearest telegraph office. On the day of the verdict, showing the skills of a saboteur, he cut the wires of all the court telephones save one to ensure that he was the first to deliver the news back to London. His inventiveness in scooping his competitors stunned his fellow reporters, with Linton Wells of the International News Service calling him a pucker chap who had given all of us a run for our money. He also had 
happened to be in the right place at the right time to impress British intelligence. So much so that in World War II, he was quickly hired to be the assistant to the director of naval intelligence. This is where a vast majority of his spy experience happened. Fleming found himself at the heart of the British intelligence machine as the intelligence arm of the Admiralty, the Naval Intelligence Division NID, was a hub of cryptographers, cartographers, interrogators and attaches. In his role, Fleming communicated with agents in occupied territory, studied purloined documents and maps, monitored German radio broadcasts, coordinated aerial reconnaissance to locate enemy vessels, handled press inquiries, keeping enterprising journalists off the scent, and read transcripts of interrogations of spies and captured German naval officers. In particular, Fleming had dealings with the political warfare executive run by Dennis Sefton Delmer. This unit was responsible for sending black propaganda to the Germans via radio communications. As part of the psychological war program, the idea was to sap German morale, and Fleming's language skills made him ideally suited for this task. This experience resulted in the creation of the one and only James Bond. So let's flash forward to 1952. Ian had a passionate affair with a woman named Anne Rothmore, which resulted in a child and a marriage. The two were at Fleming's GoldenEye estate in Jamaica, where Anne told him to write something to amuse himself. And, well, he did. A year later, Ian Fleming published what would become the first of 13 James Bond books, Casino Royale. It was such a success that the first pressing sold out almost immediately. As for the books, well, the literary Bond was a lot colder and was more of an anti-hero that had the ability to destroy Cold War era threats within 200 pages of book. It was the 1950s ideal of a masculine icon, a drinking, smoking womanizer with a license to kill whenever necessary in his duties who always saves the day and gets the girl. The books are also pretty fucking problematic! Opposite him, still at the table, sat later, a huge <laughs> grasping his elbows. They were in a tiny square cell. To the right and left were two more <laughs> in plain clothes with guns trained on them. One of the <laughs> grinned. Take it easy, folks. Enjoyed a ride, later let out one single harsh obscenity. Bonds relaxed his muscles, waiting. Which is Delimey? asked the <laughs> who had spoken. He seemed to be in charge. This one, I guess, said the <laughs> who was holding Bond's arm. He got a scar. The <laughs> grip on Bond's arm was terrific. It was as if he had two fierce tourniquets applied above the elbows. His hands were beginning to go numb. Faster and faster through the night, with the other half of his mind, he cursed Vesper and M for having sent her on the job. This was just what he had been afraid of, this blithering woman who thought they could do a man's work. Why the hell couldn't they stay at home and mind their pots and pans and stick to their frogs and gossip and leave men's work to the men. And now for this to happen to him, just when the job had come off so beautifully, for Vesper to fall for an old trick like that and get herself snatched and probably held to ransom like some bloody heroine in a strip cartoon? The silly bitch. Oddjob looked redly at Bond, as if wondering which piece to break. He opened his mouth, uttered a noise between an angry bark and a belch, spat dryly on the floor at his feet and stepped back, whirling the door shut. When the slam should have come, the door decelerated abruptly and closed with a soft, decisive double-click. The encounter put Bond in good humor. For some reason, Goldfinger had decided against killing them. He wanted them alive. Soon Bond would know why he wanted them alive, but so long as he did, Bond intended to stay alive on his own terms. Those terms included putting Oddjob and any other Korean firmly in his place, which in Bond's estimation was rather lower than apes in the mammalian hierarchy. Jesus Christ. Now that's what I call cringe! Seriously though, there were points where I had to stop reading because I was cringing so hard at how problematic this content is and was. And y'all, this shit was so bad that a lot of it was cut. Even in the 60s, shit was cut. It was that bad. Anyway, as time passed, 
Fleming wanted more. He wanted the big books. He wanted James Bond on the big screen. He detailed such wishes in correspondence with his friends. What I want is not a publisher, but a factory that will shift this opus of mine like Gone with the Naked and the Dead. I'm not trying to be vain about this book, but simply trying to squeeze the last dirty scent out of it. He went back and forth with the screenwrites as he continued to write his books. He sold the Casino Royale rights to CBS in 1954, resulting in little more than a TV special. He was in talks for a James Bond TV series for a while, but nothing officially came of it save for some short stories. The closest Fleming got to a James Bond film in the 50s was Thunderball. In late 1958, he met Irish filmmaker Kevin McClory. McClory recalled, I think he was a little bit dried up by that time. When he met me, I'd not read any of his novels. He couldn't understand why no distributor had made a film of his novels. Despite not reading any of the books, McClory saw potential in a Bond film. However, he didn't want to adapt the books, he wanted to make something new. I was working on an underwater picture for The Bahamas. I saw the potential in doing an underwater story. It's set in the Bahamas. The Bahamas is perfect for Bond. It's full of very, very rich individuals who have rather large yachts, and large yachts attract nubile, attractive young ladies who do not look at the girth of the owner, they merely look at the size of the yacht. I read a statement by President Truman when he was president uh, during the war. The Secretary of State, General Groves, had come to him and said that it would be possible that a small country or a group could obtain an atomic weapon and hold the world to ransom. The word group stood out. Both of these factors ended up forming the plot of Thunderball. After getting a story down, Fleming and McClory hired screenwriter Jack Whittingham to write the script. The group that would steal the warheads became nefarious a political organization Spectre, led by the one and only Ernst Slavo Blofeld. Everything seemed to be coming together for a proper Bond film. And then, for cost and practicality reasons, the project was dropped. Fleming ended up turning the Thunderball screenplay into a book, to which we'll discuss the fallout of later. So a Bond film seemed even less likely. But then, enter Harry Saltzman and Albert R. Broccoli. Born on 27 October 1915, Harry Saltzman was a Canadian man who grew attracted to showbiz at a young age, starting off by picking talent for European circus and vaudeville shows. He entered the film business in the 1950s by co-producing various British movies, most notably the film adaption of Saturday Night and Sunday Morning. I haven't seen it, but apparently it got good reviews. After reading Goldfinger, Saltzman was inspired to obtain the film rights for the James Bond character. He ended up purchasing a six-month option for the rights in 1961. Remember, only Casino Royale's rights were sold at this point. What is an option, you may ask? It refers to a temporary loan of the film rights to an individual or a company in hopes of getting a film made. If one is not done within the time limit, the rights return to the original owner of the material. In Saltzman's case, he struggled with trying to finance a James Bond film until he met... Albert R. Cubby Broccoli was born on 5 April 1909 and spent his early years in Queens, New York. Y'all heard that right, bitches! The main honchos who made the Bond film possible weren't even British! But y'all didn't know that! Eventually, he moved to Hollywood to live with his agent producer cousin and to get into the show business. And he managed to get it by... I should you not? God, I don't even know how to explain it. Another time, Cubby was in a bar and was challenged by a stranger to guess the result of a coin flip. Cubby made a wager but repeatedly lost. The stranger, amused by Cubby's resolve, turned out to be film producer, mogul, and inventor Howard Hughes. 
Through him, Cubby got a job as an assistant to director Howard Hawks. This led to Cubby working on the infamous 1939 film, The Outlaw, and the other films for Hawks and Hughes. God damn it! First KWA and now movie making? How many of my passions does Hughes need to sink his web flippers into? He's already, unfortunately, tied to my fucking hometown! Broccoli soon after found work as an agent. But he grew tired of that as he wanted to make movies, not agent celebrities. So after meeting producer Irving Allen, he moved to Europe to take advantage of the tax breaks they gave for films. And to escape McCarthyism, but shh. The two co-founded Warwick Productions and made films throughout the 1950s, such as The Gamma People, Idol on Parade, and of course, No Time to Die, the 1958 war film. Don't y'all remember it? It starred Victor Mature? No? Oh. Warwick Films had some of the things you would associate today with Bond films. Beautiful location filming and intense action scenes. Even some of the cast in the Bond films worked heavily with Warwick. Fun story! Broccoli and Allen tried to obtain the rights for Bond in the 1950s. They met with Fleming for lunch, but Alan blew it by insulting the books to Fleming's face, saying that they aren't even television material. Broccoli was undeterred by that disaster, though. After Warwick folded and Alan parted ways with him, he kept trying to find ways to obtain the film rights. He soon learned that they had been optioned months prior to Harry Seltzman. Now let's move on before we get into a time loop and I keep discussing the life stories of Broccoli and Seltzman over and over again. Seltzman and Broccoli took Bond to various studios, but many were not enthusiastic about the character. Why? Well, Bond was sinful! He was British! He drank and smoked! He had premarital sex! And there was no sign he worshipped Jesus! But they managed to strike a deal with United Artists, with 100% backing for six films and $1 million in financing. It helped that the then head of the studio, David Picker, was a fan of the novels and put in a good word. At the same time, they founded Eon Productions. Seltzman and Broccoli, that is. ALLEGEDLY! Eon stood for everything or nothing, as the two were banking on everything they had on the first Bond film being successful. It does, but that wasn't developed until later. It originally stood for nothing. They wanted to make Thunderball first, but remember how I said Thunderball was based off a screenplay Fleming co-wrote with Kevin McClory and Jack Whittingham? McClory sued for breach of copyright thus forcing the title into litigation. So they did Dr. No, one of the easier Bond films to adapt to the big screen. It was successful, and now the James Bond series thrives to this very day, available in DVD form at your local failing bookstore. Okay, two more things before we continue. First off, it should be noted that United Artists was famously lenient basically allowing creators to have free reign over the production of their film. David Picker even said that, United Artists' philosophy was very simple. We were never involved in the production. As a courtesy, we might go by and say hello or have a lunch, but the actual day-to-day -day nature of the interrelationship between the crew and the cast, unless there was a problem, we knew nothing about it. That went on without our involvement on any level. The only time we saw them was when they brought the picture in. They had no obligation to report to us in any way, shape, matter, or form if the picture was on budget and on schedule. Because, under the United Artists Code of Business, they were free to make their movie as long as they used the script we approved, the cast we approved, and the budget we approved. I bring this up because even before film ratings became the hot new trend, the James Bond franchise managed to get a number of things past the radar of the Moral Guardians. Secondly, because these films have recurring characters, I'm going to go ahead and briefly describe the most important ones. 
James Bond, y'all should know him, the Giga Chat of the 20th century, super spy to end all super spies. He works for MI6, which is the British equivalent of your local foreign intelligence unit. M, Bond's boss, head of MI6, tries to keep the peace, does not like it when Bond does shit his own way. Miss Moneypenny, M's secretary, she and Bond flirt a lot with each other, but it's nothing more than playful banter. Q, tech genius, makes Bond's gadgets, snarks up Bond for destroying his shit all the goddamn time. And now we can officially start era one of the James Bond films. Let's dive right in. Once again, I suck at winking. I apologize. <laughs> Before looking at the movies, I want to briefly talk about the actors who have played James Bond in each era. Since this is the only era to have two Bond actors, and the second only appears in one film, we'll discuss George Lazenby's casting when we get to On Her Majesty's Secret Service. So, Sean Connery. What hasn't been said about the most Scottish man to have ever lived? Born on 25 August 1930 to a working class family in Edinburgh, Sean Connery quit school at a young age and worked odd jobs after serving in the Navy, working his way up with small acting roles before starring in a wide variety of films in the 1950s, from a dark Paramount pick to a Disney film about leprechauns, apparently. Michael. Michael. What do you want? Cubby Broccoli actually met Connery on the set of the former, and it left a lasting impression on him. Connery was a handsome, personable guy, projecting a kind of uh, animal virility. He was tall, with a strong physical presence, and there was just the right hint of threat behind that hard smile and uh, faint Scottish burr. To me, Sean Connery is both similar to and different from Ian Fleming. Connery's Scottish working class grit certainly clashes with Fleming's more, dare I say, Sloan Ranger upbringing. But both served in the Navy, albeit in different roles, and have relentlessly fought to get their way no matter what. Cubby Broccoli called and said he had this Fleming film and thought I might fit the part. He asked me over and after we discussed it a bit further, I said I would be interested, provided they put some more humour into the story. I felt this was essential. He agreed, then said, when can you test? I asked, what test? He said, a film test. I said, sorry, but I'm not making tests. I'm well past that. Take it or leave it, but no test. Whenever Sean wanted to make a point, he'd bang his fist on the table, the desk, or his thigh, and we knew this guy had something. When he left, we watched from the window as he walked down the street, and we all said, he's got it. But Connery got the part, and his transformation to Bond began. Terence Young, the director of the film, took Connery on an extensive crash course in all things refined. Various sartorial establishments in London dressed Bond, tailored suits from Anthony Sinclair of Conduit Street, shirts and ties from Turnbull and Asser of German Street, his Joby hat from Lock and Company, and handmade shoes from Lob and Company, both of St. James Street. Young schooled Connery in a background and manners one would expect of Fleming's Eaton and Fett's educated spy. He advised Connery to sleep in his suit to get comfortable with it, taught the actor to eat with his mouth closed. Young tutored Connery into becoming the refined gentleman spy. And soon enough, the phoenix showed himself for the first time. The basic plot. After an MI6 agent assigned to Jamaica is murdered, along with his secretary, Bond is sent to investigate, as well as to learn more about the mysterious Dr. No said that agent was researching. This first Bond film sets some, but not all, of the precedents for future Bond films. It gives us multiple girls for Bond to sleep with, the gun barrel opening, albeit with Connery's stuntman, and women in the opening titles. Sexy. Fun fact! That opening was not the original intent. How do I know this? Well, I found a copy of the draft screenplay. Here's the original opener. Three blind beggars move forward. 
as they reach foreground, superimpose the main titles. As the titles continue, the three beggars move out of the scene. Two to five. Series of dissolves behind titles. The three beggars shuffling through very Kingston locales. Harbor Street, where they stop at the corner until a pedestrian directs them across when the traffic light changes. Victoria Market, past shops and booths. A slum area with brown-skinned girls lounging in the entrance of sleazy bars. One of them drops a coin in the cup. Each scene has become increasingly darker as the late afternoon wanes, as the titles end. Instead of that, we get another staple of Bond openings. Quality animated credits with a song, but not a special song. That shit ain't happening until Goldfinger. It's visually appealing and the fade to the actual movie is quite seamless. By the way, the screenplay made extensive use of the term Chinese N-word. Make of that what you will. My copy also had numerous spelling errors. At one end of the communications room, a message runner, a young woman with her shirt sleeves rolled up, calling down now as she has announced him. M is at his desk. This film also highlights the changes made from book to screen. The books weren't only problematic, but they were very political, something which Broccoli considered bad for business. We try to make entertainment for the man who sits in the seat because he's the critic, he's the judge. The theaters are full of these critics. They like this kind of picture because it's escapism, and they identify themselves with what's on the screen. We know this. They don't want to be identified with any political arrangement or any political figures. The film was directed by Terence Young, a frequent collaborator with Warwick Films that was described as the living embodiment of James Bond to the point where he could match him in wit. I bring this up because Young's films are fast-paced, rife with action, and require a need for speed to work. And it works here! With the help of editor Peter Hunt, the film embodies the fast-paced lifestyle you'd expect from the character. However, the editing is a bit clunky. I'll overlook it since it was 1962 and they were working on a tight schedule, but some cuts are just not ideal. It takes about eight minutes before we see James Bond himself, and the way they introduce him is very clever and well done. We see him play Baccarat with others at a high-class lounge, unaware that he's about to be summoned to the MI6 office to start the plot. As he plays, we don't see his face, only his back and his hands. This creates an air of mystery surrounding him, thus making the reveal of his face all the more groundbreaking. I admire your luck, Mr. Bond. James Bond. And right there, right then, we see James Bond for the first time. It's not at all underwhelming. Connery immediately proves his worth to not only portray, but be James Bond the suave yet rugged secret agent on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Connery's Bond is also quickly established as being a competent and witty person. When he gets to Jamaica to investigate the deaths in the aforementioned cold open, he immediately checks his hotel room for any bugs or wires. When he finds a woman he flirted with broke into his apartment, he playfully snarks at her. Tell me. You always dress this way for golf. Connery's Bond always seems to be one step ahead of the enemy. He immediately grows suspicious of a car being sent for him in Jamaica and plays along until it's safe enough for him to question the driver. Of course, one can't discuss Bond without also bringing up his Playboy status. But we'll get to the women Bond fucks in a little bit. I enjoyed Bond's interactions with the recurring side characters in this film, Moneypenny especially. Bond and Moneypenny have a clear chemistry and tease one another, but never go too far, remaining simply as flirty friends. Sadly, Q won't show up until the second film, but we get to see Bond's interactions with the second best M incarnation, second only, to God herself! 
But seriously, Bernard Lee was the perfect fit for an inaugural M. He's distant from his staff, but isn't above snorking at Bond for being hyper awake at three in the morning. My only complaint is that he calls Bond's gun a lady gun. When all guns are they them a gender comrades? Yes, I thought so. This damn Beretta again. I've told you about this before. You tell him for the last time. It's nice and light in a lady's handbag. It's also time to introduce a new recurring character, CIA agent Felix Leiter. He only appears in like five films today and doesn't even have a consistent actor until the Craig era, so I didn't want to talk about him until now. Sadly, Bond and Felix don't have much screen time together as his main purpose is to serve as a bit of a deus ex machina at the end of the film, but I quite enjoyed Jack Lord's performance. Many mainstream Bond films Film, critics think he was miscast and unlike the books. But fuck the books! I genuinely thought he did a good job at playing Bond's American counterpart! Not to mention that the films deviate from the books enough to make such a distinction not matter in the long run. And now we can talk about two of the women Bond fucks in this movie. Sylvia Trench and Honey Ryder. Sylvia Trench, from Bond's introduction scene, is the first real Bond girl, and I'd be damned. She's a glamorous, strong-willed woman who actually makes the move on him instead of the other way around. She was the one that broke into Bond's flat, and she ended up charming Bond to bed. Bond, grimly, you don't miss a thing. What are you doing here? Sylvia, demure, I decided to accept your invitation. Bond, more firmly still, for tomorrow afternoon? Sylvia, moving towards him seductively. I do hope I'm wearing the right thing. Bond, not quite so firmly as her charms begin to have their effect. The right thing, but the wrong moment. I have to leave immediately. He glances at his watch to verify the time. Sylvia, standing on tiptoe to kiss him. That's too bad. Just as it was getting interesting again. They kiss. Sylvia, in a murmur. When did you say you had to leave? Bond, also in a murmur. Immediately. They kiss again. His resolve weakens. Well, almost immediately. Sadly, her time in the film is short, but she's incredible. And her actress was a year older than Sean Connery! Take that, liberals! Apparently, they intended to make Sylvia a recurring character as Bond's booty call, but she was retired after the second film. It's a shame. I genuinely liked her. Oh, that's too bad. The main Bond girl in the film is Honey Ryder. Her first appearance is just as spectacular as mainstream Bond fans say, with her coming out of the ocean in nothing but a bikini, which was more modest than what she was wearing in the book, but... Okay. To be honest, I don't understand why Honey is so iconic aside from her entrance. She doesn't make that much of an impact on the plot, and literally nothing would change without her. She's merely a shell of a character! Well, I thought that was funny! I also don't understand why James and Honey end up together by the end of the film. They have little screen time together, and Honey was a victim of circumstance. Like, I get that she's hot, but to me it feels like they were strangled by the red string. Especially when you compare their relationship with Bond's relationships in other films. And before you say, Honey's not a shell, she told Bond her backstory! One, that's irrelevant. A useless character is a useless character regardless of character development. Two, said backstory makes the James and Honey dynamic even worse. Sure, Dr. No killed her father, maybe, but... Leaving. He let me stay on for a while without paying. Then one night he came up to my room. I scratched his face and then... But he was stronger than I was. And what happened after that? I put a black widow spider underneath his mosquito net. Yep, you heard that right, buckaroos. They decided to go the Bond woos a sexual assault survivor and makes her feel loved again route. What the actual fuck? And that's not even the worst thing in this film. There are three main 
villains in the movie, Miss Taro, Professor Dent, and Dr. No himself. Dent has the least amount of notes for me, so I'll start with him. Professor Dent is a geologist who is secretly, but not so secretly, working with Dr. No. The MI6 agent murdered in Jamaica was in contact with him about some geological samples, which Dent takes well when asked by Bond about it. Oh no, I... I threw them away. Well, have you any idea where he found them? No, he, he didn't say it. Crab key, perhaps? Definitely not. He ends up getting killed by Bond after stupidly firing his entire magazine in a dummy when ordered to kill him. But at least Bond was able to flex on him while doing so. It's a Smith and Wesson. And you've had your six. <laughs> And then we have Miss Taro, and oh fuck, we have to talk about one of the most racist parts of the movie. Look, I know that Yellowface was normal at the time, and Miss Taro and Dr. No are actually very competent and defy the yellow menace stereotype. But was it really that fucking hard to find actual Asian actors? The scenes in Dr. No's lair are full of Asian people! One of them could have been Miss Taro or Dr. No? Y'all were already casting a lot of unknowns. So come on, for fuck's sake. I will say this, though. Dr. No's characterization in the film is much better than what it was in the book. According to one of the screenwriters... When Wolf and I began working on the script, we decided that Fleming's Dr. No was the most ludicrous character in the world. It was just Fu Manchu with steel hooks. It was 1961 and we felt that audiences just wouldn't stand for that kind of stuff anymore. Back to the villains in general. Miss Taro is a worthy opponent for Bond, using his lust for pussy to lure him into a trap for Dent to kill him. Hence why Dent wasted his entire magazine on a dummy. The two have all right chemistry, but just... Why? Why the yellow face? Bond gets rid of her in the most anticlimactic way possible, though. By calling the police and getting her arrested. It's actually pretty funny, as Bond calling the police is the last thing you'd expect from him. Dr. No doesn't have much screen time with Bond either, as we don't see him in the flesh until the last half hour of the movie, but my comments about him are similar to Miss Taro's. Competent, intelligent, a worthy opponent, why the yellow face fucking hell? The one conversation Bond and Dr. No have is rather interesting. He reveals he's a part of the apolitical evil organization Spectre, because in these early films, of course, it's Spectre. It's always Spectre! But wait, you may ask, isn't Spectre's copyright owned by someone else? We'll get to that in a later movie, don't worry. Dr. No has a good reason to keep Bond alive. He tries to get Bond to join him. They could be powerful together. They could conquer the world. Bond takes this proposition well. <laughs> Though speaking of problematic entities, it's time we talk about Quirrell, the one black main character. He's a Jamaican fisherman who's been helping Felix get intel on Dr. No and his operations. He's also a racist stereotype who only speaks in jive. Ain't my friend what gets addresses mixed. After watching this movie three or four times, I have a treasure trove of things that make Quirrell such a fucking stereotype. Let me show you. He is okay with using brute force to attack a lady. Nothing out of this gal. You want for me to break her arm? He is incredibly superstitious, unlike the white people who are alongside him. It don't do for a man to tempt providence too often. You see, there's a dragon. What? Native superstition. Started by Dr. No, probably. And these bits are just super fucking racist. No matter how you try and spin it. Tell this ape to let me go. That's my shoes. He's also the sacrificial lamb of the movie, getting killed by, quote, the dragon, actually a flamethrower tank used by Dr. No's guards to keep others out, especially the superstitious racial stereotypes. Make of that what you will. That's all I have to say about the major parts of the movie, so here are some final notes before we move on. One advantage of this movie's low budget is that it's a lot more grounded than its successors. As y'all will see later, future films go all out in the pomp and circumstance. Here, Dr. No has an island he uses to carry out his evil plan. That's it. Soon we'll get into hollowed out volcanoes and 
invisible space stations, but we'll cross those bridges when we reach them. The book's ending, according to what I've read, involved Bond fighting a giant octopus for some reason. I prefer him tossing Dr. No into the radioactive chemical water instead. Overall score? 6 out of 10. A decent film, but has glaring flaws I cannot look over. The film was a surprise hit, getting rave reviews on both sides of the pond. This resulted in a bigger budget for the next Bond film, which we'll get to right fucking now! The Basic Plot Angered by the death of Dr. No, Spectre plans to kill James Bond by tricking a Soviet girl into seducing him, getting a valuable decoding device along the way. After the success of Dr. No, United Artists was eager to make lightning strike twice. They doubled the second film's production budget and upped the salaries for Saltzman and Broccoli. For Russia With Love was picked as the second book to adapt for various reasons. Thunderball was still in litigation, Fleming's latest Bond book flopped, and From Russia With Love was a recognizable title that then-President Kennedy himself called one of his favorite books. Connery, despite financial reservations, was eager to return for a second stint as Bond, and much of the crew from Dr. No carried over to the new movie. Terrence Young directed, Peter Hunt edited, Ted Ward did the cinematography, and Richard Meinbaum wrote the screenplay in collaboration with Johanna Harwood. From Russia with Love adds more of what you expect from a Bond film. Q, albeit no gadgets just yet, Blofeld, the evil head of Spectre, and a Bond girl that actually serves a purpose in the plot! Thank Despite having the trappings of a Cold War era spy flick, the producers rightfully removed references to any of the villains being communist and anything being communism's fault. Broccoli recalled, We decided to steer 007 and the scripts clear of politics. Bond would have no identifiable political affiliation. None of the protagonists would be the stereotyped, iron curtain or inscrutable oriental villain. It was old-fashioned and would induce pointless controversy. Ironically, some criticized the film for not being anti-Russian enough. Commentary Magazine held forth that we weren't anti-Russian enough. In fact, I think we were ahead of the government policy towards the Russians. We let up on them sooner than the government did. We had the main villain become a defector from the Russians and attributed all that was going on to Blofeld's bunch, unlike the novel. This was also the first Bond film to have a cold open, the action prologue with relevance to the plot! We see Spectre training an assassin to kill Bond in retaliation for what happened in the first film. This Draco Malfoy lookalike named Red Grant. The way it's written in the screenplay and how it's shown in the movie is intense and makes good use of camera angles to emphasize the suspense. Close shot. The feet of another man wearing sweatpants and soft shoes walk forward. Close shot. Bond turns forward again, looks around, and continues walking. Close shot. The other man's feet walk quietly up some steps. Wide moving shot. Bond runs down a tree-lined path toward a statue. Hears a bird coo and looks back. Wide shot. The other man is crossing the bridge. He is Donald Grant. He stops and looks in front of him. Medium shot. Bond, holding a revolver, moves towards some trees. Medium shot. Grant stops on the bridge, looking forward, then cracks a branch of a tree. Bond stops suddenly at the sound. He looks back, pauses thinking, then continues walking. Grant watches, then moves forward, and Grant's feet walk forward but stop. Pivot back and walk in a different direction. Medium moving shot. Bond looks back, walks forward, hears a bird cooing again, looks back, then walks forward again. This is followed by one of the more bizarre opening sequences, featuring a belly dancer for reasons I cannot think of. Hint, it's sex appeal. The first 20 minutes of the movie are spent setting up the gambit before introducing Bond. I'll give you all a spark notes of it and introduce the villains. I might as well because most of the baddies don't have any direct interaction with Bond, and the fun of the movie is watching Bond find out what we already know. So, the plan. Spectre plans to humiliate both British and Soviet intelligence and potentially cause World War III. How? Get a British agent and a Russian agent to fuck? Film 
film it and then kill both of them and make it look like a murder-suicide. This has the added bonus of killing Bond in retaliation for what happened in Dr. No and obtaining a decoder used in Soviet intelligence so they can engage in counterintelligence and terrorism. That's the TLDR of it. Don't complain in the comments, please. Again, I am not Wikipedia. Blofeld, the man with the cat, is the leader of Spectre, the apolitical evil organization hellbent on taking over the world. There's not much to say about him yet, as he isn't too important of a character, but Anthony Dawson has the sinister... torso and voice of a true supervillain in that cat. <laughs> I love it. The first of the villains introduced after the credits is Tov Kronstein, a Czechoslovakian grand chess master who is head of planning for Spectre. I enjoyed his introduction through a chess championship as it establishes him as a cold, calculating man who thinks of every scenario before jumping into something. This is confirmed in his next scene. Because I have anticipated every possible variation of of course, Bond subverts some of Kronstein's predictions, but it's the thought that counts. Red Grant is the only villain to have interactions with Bond for a large portion of the film, and he makes for a great henchman. He's covert, yet menacing. He's intelligent, but brutal. His fatal flaw is his hubris, as his gloating to Bond when he almost has him is what gets him killed. But he got the trick Bond into thinking he was an ally! That is so fucking brilliant! And now, we get to the main villain, or should I say, villainess! She is the creme de la creme, the Iron Lady, Rosa Clegg. Rosa is a competent villain. She's stern, she's cold, and I totally see her as someone who would double-cross her country folk for Spectre's sake. Hell, she kills Kronstein for his predictions not working out, and what makes her especially good is that she is a huge improvement from the book counterpart. In the book, Rosa was a toad-like butch lesbian who was still working for the Soviets. She even scared the Bond girl by coming on to her. Here, she's horny for power at best, and it's explicitly mentioned that she defected from the Soviets to serve Spectre, but that most under her didn't know that. Even though the film's main Bond girl is introduced before the man himself, let's talk about some other things first. Bond here is the same as he was in the first film. He may be a little more reliant on his gadgets, but he still has to get out of things with his wits and intelligence and stay one step ahead of the enemy. This time, though, his wits don't always work, and the results are very interesting. As I said before, I love how Red Grant bamboozled Bond into thinking he was an ally, especially since people tend to see him as this super spy who is always on top of things. It's funny to me, but in a good, unironic way. There's nothing else to say as there isn't much that's different in terms of formula. Bond's interactions with Moneypenny and M are entertaining, and there's a scene later on in the film that builds on his relationship with both of them. While on a live feed to give MI6 the details of the decoder, he says this. Oh, once when I was with M in Tokyo, we had an interesting experience. Thank you, Miss Moneypenny. That's all, that's all. This shows that despite his cold exterior, M is someone who will casually hang out with Bond on occasion, such as when they did whatever they did in Japan. Cock and ball torture? I don't know. And Moneypenny listening in from her desk shows some more signs to her. Aside from what seems like a sense of voyeurism, she probably has at least retained some feelings for James. And we finally meet Q, played by Desmond Llewellyn. He is the best and longest serving Q, playing the part all the way to the actor's death in 1999. And he's amazing. His snarky attitude towards Bond plays well with Connery Bond's disregard for keeping things all nice and clean. In later worse films, he's one of the few saving graces. And now we shall discuss the main attraction, Bond girl Tatiana Lomanova, or Tanya for short. 
Tanya is much more fleshed out and relevant to the story than Honey. She's not the best girl in this era, but she is a beautiful, educated girl who actually has a personality and doesn't become a damsel in distress. Her introduction scene, once you understand what she and her colleagues are saying, establishes her as not just a prop or a puppet of the Soviets or Spectre, but as a girl with a life outside of her job, which is quite refreshing. A porter holds open a wrought iron gate and three embassy women emerge onto the sidewalk. A striking blonde, Tatiana Romanova, known as Tanya, and her friends Irina and Natasha. Tanya holds a piece of paper. Irina, in Russian. Are you sure you don't want to come with us? Tanya, in Russian. I have some shopping to do. Natasha, in Russian. We'll see you later in the hospital. Irina, in Russian. Don't be late. Goodbye for now. Tanya, in Russian. Goodbye for now. Natasha, in Russian. Goodbye for now. Irina and Natasha walk away. Tanya turns, looking at the pieces of paper, and walks off. In the film, Tanya is an employee of the Soviet consulate in Istanbul, and is one of the people below Rosa. Rosa takes advantage of Tanya's assumption that she's still loyal to Russia, and instructs her to seduce James Bond under the guise of defecting to gain intel. Speaking of Rosa, I don't consider her first scene with Tanya to be the former coming on to the latter, but as someone in a position of authority reassuring her subordinate and coercing her into doing her bidding. Again, Rosa only seems to be horny for power at best and shit at respecting boundaries at worst. It takes a while for them to meet, unlike most Bond films, but it works because we know what the situation is. We know both of them are getting played. We know that they're gonna end up together. What we don't know are the wins, where's, and how's. And that is what makes the movie interesting to me. That is the suspense. And when they do meet, it's clear they have chemistry, they flirt and tease each other, and they do exactly what Spectre wants them to do. By the way, Tatiana Romanova's actress Daniela Bianchi was 21 at the time of filming. Sean Connery was 32. Make of that what you will. Especially since it seems that Bond has wanted to fuck her ever since he saw her photo. However, while I think that Tanya is a much better Bond girl than Honey, I do take issue with how quickly Tanya falls for Bond. It feels like another strangled by the red string situation. The most logical explanation I could think of for why it only takes a single dicking for her to fall in love with him is that she, like her actress, was 21. Young adults can be very dumb like that. Unless you're me, of course. Tanya also being the one who kills Rosa at the end is a nice touch, and is entirely justifiable as Rosa had been playing her like a fiddle for Spectre's sake the entire time. Rosa betrayed Tanya, thus Rosa had to die by her hands. It also makes sense in regards to the scene. Originally, they were going to have Rosa stab herself with her knife shoe that was also poisoned, but they decided Tanya shooting her would be more logical. Sadly, Tanya has one of the most uncomfortable scenes not only in the film, but in the entire Bond franchise. But to talk about it, we need to start talking about the problematic aspects of From Russia With Love. One of Bond's allies in the film is Ali Kalembe, a Turkish man who leads the MI6 station in Istanbul. He is intelligent, good-natured, does not use the as long as she enjoyed it defense unlike his book counterpart, and he's played by Mexican actor Pedro Armendariz which is better than having a white person in yellow face, I guess. But come on! Y'all were shooting on location in Turkey! Was nobody in Turkish cinema available? That's my biggest problem with Kelim Bey. He's hedonistic and sexist, but in a way that's par for the course in 1963. And again, he is a competent man who always seems to know what he's doing, even when he's in bed with a much younger female. I just feel like I would have enjoyed the character more if he was actually played by someone of Turkish descent. I bring him up now to give you all some context for the aforementioned Tanya scene. 
As part of Spectre's plan, Hania Bond and Kelembe steal the decoder from the Soviet consulate and flee on the Orient Express, which, fun fact gamers, was a real train and not just an Agatha Christie invention! A Soviet officer tails them, but Bond and Kelembe subdue him. Kelembe stays with the officer in a separate cabin to keep an eye on him, but Red Grant kills both of them while Bond and Tanya aren't looking staging it as a murder-suicide. Obviously, this makes Bond question Tanya's true motives, and if she's been bamboozling him for the Soviet Union's sake. He's rightfully upset at the death of his friend and questions Tanya about what she knows, but accumulates in... this. Liar. Ah! This is not justified, no matter how you spin it, and it's especially disturbing knowing Connery's stance on hitting women. I don't think there is anything particularly wrong in hitting a woman, though I don't recommend you do it in the same way you hit a man. There are women who take it to the wire. That's what they are looking for, the ultimate confrontation. They want a smack. And yes, I know that Connery denied being a supporter of violence against women. It said in 2006 that hitting women is not okay, but given that he said shit like this in the past, as well as the accusations from his ex-wife that he was abusive, it just leaves a sour taste in my mouth when I see him physically assault women in the movies. Bond, particularly in the early films, is quite the chauvinistic hedonist, but there was a description of his treatment towards women in 1984's The James Bond Bedside Companion that intrigued me. The critics who accuse Fleming of chauvinism overlook the obvious good things Bond does for the women in the novels. For example, he's always a gentleman and treats his ladies with the utmost respect. He has not once hit a woman. He has not once hit a woman. He is he always, always a, gentleman. a gentleman. And I know this author is referring to the book Bond and not the movie Bond, but the way he wrote about this scene leaves much to be desired. There is also an additional well-written scene in the movie between Bond and Tanya aboard the Orient Express in which Bond confronts the girl with Karim's death. This scene took place off-screen in the novel. Its inclusion in the film adds a moment of authentic, dramatic conflict between the two characters. Yeah, a moment of authentic, dramatic conflict, where Bond needlessly slaps a lady who also has no idea what's going on. What the fuck? Of course, there is one more scene in the movie that's more offensive than this by far. I am of course referring to the Romani campground. And yes, I will only be referring to the Romanis using the correct terminology. The G word is considered derogatory by them. If you take issue to my political correctness, please forward all complaints to I don't care at fuck.off. Facts don't care about your shitty beliefs. This scene serves little purpose save for a minor plot point I'm glossing over. Its two main objectives are to revel in Romani stereotypes and have two scantily clad women catfight over a man, which again is the modest version of the scene. In the book, the girls were naked because Ian Fleming was the most divorced man to ever walk the earth. The one small silver lining of this is that both girls were of age. I checked. One was 23 and the other was 21. Before you award the filmmakers a prize for basic decency though, neither of them were of Romani descent. One was white Jamaican, the other was Israeli. Fuck. Now, I must stress that the Romani stereotypes aren't the main issue here, though they certainly don't help matters. It was 1963 and such stereotypes were all over the place. The main issue is the fact that the filmmakers thought the catfight between two scantily clad women was a necessary scene in the film. While watching it, I tensed up and gritted my teeth. I was so fucking uncomfortable. Oh, and it ends with Bond being able to fuck both of them. I'm not kidding. Barbara said for you to decide. So decide. They're both yours. <laughs> this might take some time. Ew. 
One final thing before I move on. The screenplay for this movie says that there's supposed to be Romani spoken in this scene, and while there are times when people clearly aren't speaking English, Thank you, thank you. <laughs> whether or not it's correct Romani, I sadly do not know. Like, it's impossible for me to find out as the screenplay is worded like this. Vavra calls out in Romani. The first man separates the two girls. Karim turns to Bond. No matter what happens now, say and do nothing. The two girls approach as Vavra talks to them in Romani. Three shot. Bond, Karim, and Vavra. As Vavra continues speaking in Romani, dolly in on Bond and Karim. If any of y'all at home speak Romani, please let me know if what they're saying is accurate or not. I have a bounty of $0073 to anyone who can conclusively prove what these people are saying. That's all I have to say about the meat of the film. So before we move to my final thoughts, here are some miscellaneous notes. When Bond arrives in Turkey, there is an interesting subversion from the first film I appreciated. While in Dr. No, the villain sent a car for Bond to be killed, From Russia With Love has Karim Bey actually send a car for him, which is confirmed via spy speak. Can I borrow a match? I use a lighter. It's better still. Until they go wrong. Exactly. It's very clever and quite entertaining. Anyway, the film works for the most part. It still has stereotypes and scenes that age poorly, but it has a more interesting plot than Dr. No and a Bond girl that actually serves a purpose. Not to mention how Ian Fleming's dirty communist villains were written out. Apparently, the film had a troubled production as well due to Pedro Amandariz's failing health and the production being rushed for an October 1963 release, forcing everything to be done within four months. The fact that they managed to make an improved sequel despite these setbacks is very admirable. Overall score, 7 out of 10. A vast improvement from Dr. No, but still could be a lot less racist. And now, it's time for my favorite film of this era! The basic plot. Bond is sent to investigate shady businessman Auric Goldfinger and uncovers a plot that could have negative ramifications for the whole world! Goldfinger is, without a doubt, the best film in this era. It's a fun romp with genuinely interesting characters, a headstrong Bond girl, and a shocking lack of yellow face! This is also the start of the remaining tropes present in Bond films. The gadgets, the title theme to and white people who aren't villains actually dying! Terrence Young had declined to return due to wanting something new, thus being replaced by Guy Hamilton. Connery was pleased with everything going on, especially the paycheck. Bond's going to make me rich, depending on how the tax works out. Rich enough to retire, though, I suppose. I have a contract to do three more Bond movies in the next three and a half years, and I'm perfectly happy about it. It gives me security for that time and also leaves me free to make other films for a great deal of money. When compared to the other films, I struggled for a while to find out why I really enjoyed this over the others, especially since it follows most of the other Era 1 films to a T. But then, I figured it out. Despite having the trappings of a typical Bond film, it's still grounded in reality! Bond's only gadgets here are a tracker and some cool effects he has in his company car. He still has to rely on his wits and training to get out of things, such as a jail cell in Goldfinger's Kentucky Fried Mansion! And he makes mistakes! Not everything goes his way! He spends half of the movie at Goldfinger's mercy, able to be killed at any time! And no escape plan works! No attempt to call for help works! 
Bond even admits to his shortcomings for what? In the first scene after the opening, he seduces Goldfinger's assistant, Jill Masterson, and hijacks his card game when instructed to simply keep an eye on him. This gets Jill killed by skin suffocation, which was something people thought could happen at the time, and Bond almost arrested by the Miami Beach police. He was supposed to observe Mr. Goldfinger, not borrow his girlfriend. Instead of that, Goldfinger goes off to Europe, and it's only by the grace of God, your friend Leiter, and my intervention with the British Embassy in Washington, that you're not in the custody of the Miami Beach police. Sir, I'm aware of my shortcomings. This vulnerable and mistake-making bond is one I want to actually see succeed. Granted, he still does sexist shit. Dink, say goodbye to Felix. Hmm? Uh, man talk. The problem I have with later Bond films is that we're supposed to see him as the best agent, the very best, like no one ever was. And that takes away from my enjoyment of the films. I don't know about you, but when I go to the movies, I want to feel existential dread. And sure, I don't feel that much dread when watching Goldfinger, but it's realistic enough for me to feel at least something. So let's talk more about the rest of that post credits opening as it's one of my favorite scenes of all time. <laughs> After Bond's little sexist tirade, Felix tells Bond his reasons for being here. Bond's been tasked to keep an eye on rich bastard Arlick Goldfinger, who at this point had been winning relentlessly against a beta character at Gin Rummy. He goes to Goldfinger's suite to investigate, finding out that his assistant, Jill Masterson, was helping him cheat to win. He infiltrates the game and manages to charm Jill into consensually sleeping with him, but like an Icarus, he flew too close to the sun. Jill's death also sets up Bond's eventual capture. When Bond is trying to catch up with Goldfinger in Switzerland to see what his deal is, he runs into Tilly, Jill's sister. Tilly wants revenge for what Goldfinger did to Jill and sadly doesn't play much of a role in the film. She has about 10 minutes of screen time before she's killed. She has a more important role in the book as one of the, quote, Damaged lesbians. Also, as y'all know, this is one of the films I read the book for. And the book was the most uncomfortable out of the three I read. It's unashamedly racist, homophobic, it has a 20 page chapter devoted to golf! Goldfinger had already teed up. Bond walked slowly behind him, followed by Walker. Bond stood and leant on his driver. He said, I thought you said we would be playing the strict rules of golf, but I'll give you that putt. That makes you one up. Goldfinger nodded curtly. He went through his practice routine and hit his usual, excellent, safe drive. The third is a blind 240 yards. All carry a difficult three. Bond chose his brassy and hit a good one. It would be on or near the green. Goldfinger's routine drive was well hit, but would probably not have enough steam to carry the last of the rough and trickle down into the saucer of the green. Sure enough, Goldfinger's ball was on top of the protecting mound of rough. He had a nasty, cuppy lie with a tuft just behind the ball. Goldfinger stood and looked at the lie. He seemed to make up his mind. He stepped past his ball to take club from the caddy. His left foot came down just behind the ball, flattening the tuft. Goldfinger could now take his putter. He did so and trickled the ball down the bank towards the hole. It stopped three feet short. The tenth at the Royal St. Mark's is the most dangerous hole on the course. The second shot to the skiddy plateau green with cavernous bunkers to right and left and a steep hill beyond has broken many hearts. Bond remembered that Philip Scrutton, out in four under four as in the Gold Bowl, had taken a 14 at this hole, seven of them ping-pong shots from one bunker to another, to and fro across the green. Bond knew that Goldfinger would play his second to the apron, or short of it, and be glad to get a five. 
Bond must go for it and get his four. The sun was on its way down and the shadows of the four men were beginning to lengthen. Bond had taken up his stance. It was a good lie. He had kept his driver. There was dead silence as he gave his two incisive waggles. This was going to be a vital stroke. Remember to pause at the top of the swing, come down slow, and whip the club head through at the last second. Bond began to take the club back. Something moved at the corner of his right eye. From nowhere, the shadow of Goldfinger's huge head approached the ball on the ground, engulfed it, and moved on. Bond let his swing take itself to pieces and sections. Then he stood away from his ball and looked up. Goldfinger's feet were still moving. He was looking carefully up at the sky. Now Goldfinger was on the tee. Now he had bent down. The ball was on the peg, its lying face turned up at him. But Goldfinger had straightened, had stood back, was taking his two deliberate practice swings. He stepped up to the ball, cautiously, deliberately, stood over it, waggled, focusing the ball minutely. Surely he would see. Surely he would stop and bend down at the last minute to inspect the ball. Would the waggle never end? But now the club head was going back, coming down, the left knee bent correctly in towards the ball, the left arm straight as a ramrod. Crack! The ball sailed off, a beautiful drive, as good as Goldfinger had hit, straight down the fairway. Bond's heart sang. Got you, you bastard. Got you. But the film, there are no damaged lesbians. Bond doesn't make any overtly racist remarks. And odd job, Goldfinger's Korean bodyguard, is treated a lot better. At least in terms of stereotypes. The film is also genuinely interesting as we don't know what exactly Goldfinger is up to until right before the climax, when we finally learn of his true intent to render the American gold supply worthless. Speaking of, let's talk about the villain himself. He's great! His gold obsession is obvious, but not too over the top. His plans are outlandish, but more believable than they were in the books. His appearance is threatening, but not too threatening. The rest of Goldfinger's threatening aura comes from Oddjob, a mute Korean manservant who is actually played by an actor of Asian descent, particularly by Japanese-American wrestler-turned-actor Harold Sakata. While I take issue with the implications of an Asian man being subservient, to a white person, our job is a capable fighter with a razor-sharp bowler hat. He has a long fight sequence with Bond near the end that puts the two at equals, with Bond having to rely on his wits to have Oddjob meet his demise. And trust me, babes, in the book, Oddjob was a very uncomfortable stereotype of Asian people. Oddjob had dressed and was standing respectfully at attention. You did well, Oddjob. I'm glad to see you are in training. Here. Goldfinger took the cat from under his arm and tossed it to the Korean, who caught it eagerly. I am tired of seeing this animal around. You may have it for dinner. The Korean's eyes gleamed. Tell them in the kitchen that we will have our own dinner at once. The Korean inclined his head sharply and turned away. Bond's womanizing plays a more central role to the plot this time. We already talked about Jewel Masterson, but Bond's seduction of Goldfinger's pilot, Pussy Galore, sets up the ultimate twist in the climax. Speaking of Pussy, can we talk about her? She is absolutely iconic. Not only is she a competent member of the enemy side, an ace pilot, and five years older than Bond, she is also a major improvement from her book counterpart. In the book, Pussy was the leader of a lesbian gang and was one of the two, quote, damaged lesbians that needed a man to heal her. Just... Here are Ian Fleming's views on homosexuality in the flesh. Bond liked the look of Pussy Galore. He felt the sexual challenge all beautiful lesbians have for men. He was amused by the uncompromising attitude that said to Goldfinger into the room, All men are bastards and cheats. Don't try any masculine hocus on me. I don't go for it. I'm in a separate league. Bond thought she would be in her early 30s. She had pale, Rupert Brooke good looks with high cheekbones and a beautiful jawline. She had the only violet eyes Bond had ever seen. They were the true deep violet of a pansy, and they looked candidly out at the world from beneath straight black brows. Her hair, which was as black as Tilly Masterton's, was worn in an untidy urchin cut. The mouth was a decisive slash of deep vermilion. Bond thought she was superb, and so, he noticed, did Tilly Masterton, who was gazing at Miss Galore with worshipping eyes and lips that yearned. 
Bond decided that all was now clear to him about Tilly Masterton. Bond came to the conclusion that Tilly Masterton was one of those girls whose hormones had got mixed up. He knew the type well and thought they and their male counterparts were a direct consequence of giving votes to women and sex equality. As a result of 50 years of emancipation, feminine qualities were dying out or being transferred to the males. Pansies of both sexes were everywhere, not yet completely homosexual but confused, not knowing what they were. The result was a herd of unhappy sexual misfits, barren and full of frustrations. The women wanting to dominate and the men to be nannied. He was sorry for them, but he had no time for them. Bond smiled sourly to himself as he remembered his fantasies about this girl as they sped along the valley of the Loire. Entre deux scènes, indeed. Later. Bond looked down into the deep blue violet eyes that were no longer hard, imperious. He bent and kissed them lightly. He said, They told me you only liked women. Pussy said, I never met a man before. The toughness came back into her voice. I come from the South. You know the definition of a virgin down there? Well, it's a girl who can run faster than a brother. In my case, I couldn't run as fast as my uncle. I was 12. That's not so good, James. You ought to be able to guess that. None of the preceding excerpts were edited, except for clarity. Ian Fleming really was that fucked. It's important to note that the book was published only five years before the film adaption, and even the people who worked on the film at the time thought Fleming's beliefs were so fucked that they cut out almost all of them. Because remember, Literary Bond was Ian Fleming's alter ego, his self-insert character, his Mary Sue self-insert, if you will. In the film, Pussy is a tough, independent, chaotic neutral who is shown to only be in on Goldfinger's plan for the money. You retired to England, I suppose? No, I spotted a little island in the Bahamas. I'll hang up a sign. No trespassing. As a result, Bond's seduction of her kind of works, and Honor Blackman was the perfect fit for the second best Bond girl in Arrow 1. We'll get to the best later. However, a bit of Pussy's non-straightness still exists, and it strikes a wrong chord with me. In her first scene with Bond, she says this. You can turn off the charm. I'm immune. And it can be interpreted that her, quote, immunity comes from her sexuality. I personally don't read it as that, mostly because I want to believe that Pussy was just being strong and independent and playing hard to get. A few more notes before my final thoughts. I haven't talked about the cold open yet because it's not relevant to the plot of the film. In the book, the scene caused Bond to have a rare moment of self-reflection, but here it's a bit extraneous. It's entertaining though. Felix returns, this time played by Sek Lender. He's alright. Not the best Felix, but he's a very nice lad I want to have dinner with. One other issue I have with this film is the shoehorning of China into the conflict. Not only is this one of those shitty, quote, dirty communist stereotypes, but it was completely unnecessary. I guess it explains how Goldfinger got the bomb to blow up Fort Knox, but that wasn't a question I was asking. Goldfinger is the shortest Bond film, well, was until Quantum of Solace, running at about 1 hour and 50 minutes. This shorter running time helps with my enjoyment of it. Instead of 20 pages of golf, it's fast, snappy, and doesn't linger on a scene for too long. Overall score, 9 out of 10. Fun, we'll watch again, has some minor wrinkles that need ironing, but nothing that's not out of the ordinary at the time. Way less fucked up than the book. Now though, we must open the can of worms we must take a look at. Before we begin the movie proper, it's finally time for me to discuss the rights issues surrounding Thunderball. As I previously mentioned, Ian Fleming co-wrote the screenplay for it with Kevin McClory and Jack Winningham. The screenplay introduced 
Spectre, the apolitical nefarious organization that wants to take over the world, yada yada yada, you know the drill. Ultimately, the movie didn't get made, and Fleming wrote a novelization of the screenplay without crediting Whittingham or McClory. Both were rightfully upset and petitioned the UK's High Court for an injunction against the book. The judge allowed for Thunderball to be published, but an official trial regarding the rights began in November 1963, with McClory suing for plagiarism and false attribution of authorship. By the time the trial began, Whittingham dropped out as a plaintiff due to financial difficulties, but remained involved as a witness. McClory's case was strong, especially due to Whittingham's testimony and a letter from Fleming's solicitors admitting to taking major plot points from the screenplay. The trial would have gone on for much longer were it not for Fleming's failing health. As a result, both parties settled out of court. Fleming retained the book right while giving credit to McClory and Winningham, and McClory retained the film rights. Fleming would die nine months after the trial's end, one month before the world premiere of Goldfinger. But wait, you ask. If McClory had the film rights, how did Eon get to make a Thunderball film? The short answer is, Seltzman and Broccoli reached a deal with McClory to co-produce the film offering him $250,000 and 20% of the profits in exchange for him not making a Thunderball movie for 10 years. Broccoli said of the deal, We didn't want anyone else to make Thunderball. We had the feeling that if anyone else came in and made their own Bond film, it would have been bad for our series. After Goldfinger, we naturally felt we knew more about Bond than anyone else. So I went ahead and made the deal with McClory to ensure that the best of Fleming's stories could be our film. Remember what Broccoli said here. It'll be important later. The basic plot, Spectre steals two atomic bombs and holds them at ransom, demanding money from major western countries, but is sent to the Bahamas to find the bombs before it's too late! Thunderball promised to be bigger and better than the previous Bond films. The budget was doubled, the gadgets increased, the special effects were emphasized, and it shows on a technical side too. This was the first film in the franchise to be shot in cinema. Scope, the 2.39 to 1 aspect ratio that's common for widescreen cinematic films. This allows for more action to be shown and for you to envelope yourself in the action more effectively. However, Thunderball sucks. I don't like it. The opening starts strong with a wonderfully hammy scene of Bond fighting a man in drag, but it quickly loses focus right before the incredible, I might add, opening song by Tom Jones by having him escape in a fucking jetpack! And it gets worse from there. Bond here succumbs to the stereotypes of spy films. He becomes the escapist, perfect fantasy character you can see yourself as. And as a result, I feel nothing for him. I don't care about his goals and desires. I just want him off my lawn, especially after the first few scenes with him. Part of me thinks this apathy and escapist fantasy of a character comes from Connery's own disillusionment with Bond at this point, worrying about being typecast and known only as Bond. The problem is to get across the fact, without breaking your arse, that one is not Bond that one was functioning reasonably well before Bond, and that one is going to function reasonably well after Bond. There are a lot of things I did before Bond, like playing the classics on stage, that don't seem to get publicised. So you see, this Bond image is a, is a problem in a way, and a bit of a bore, but one has just got to live with it. Another potential factor is that Kevin McClory wasn't the most competent of film folk. Guy Hamilton recalled, Kevin McClory I knew well because I was an assistant and he was a boom operator. He was a fucking nuisance, always slow getting his shadow out of the way. We were on many pictures, also in digs together, just by Shepperton Studios. Back to the film at hand. In the first scene, Bond is at a health clinic. Why? 
really never explains. But I guess it's another vacation. He also threatens to assault Money Penny. Money Penny, next time I see you, I'll put you across my knee. On yogurt and lemon juice? This is not cute. Unless you're in a mutually consensual BDSM thing, this is harassment. Don't do this. Don't worry, y'all. It gets worse. Brief content warning for sexual assault. If you're uncomfortable by depictions of it, here's the timestamp to skip it. Bond has the hots for this nurse at the health clinic, Patricia or Pat for short. This feeling is not mutual. So what does Bond do? Behave yourself, Mr. Bond. So, um, that's assault. Pat clearly didn't consent to that. Go directly to jail, Mr. Bond. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. But wait, there's more! Pat hooks Bond up to some massager and a villain infiltrates the room while she's not looking and turns the machine to the maximum setting, causing him to almost fall unconscious. Pat arrives in the nick of time to free him, resulting in... this. Somebody's gonna wish the dead never happened. Well, you wouldn't tell Dr. Wayne. Please, I'd lose my job. Well, I... I suppose my silence could have a price. do mean... Oh, no. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to defend that at all. There is no justification for what Bond did. He clearly coerced Pat into finally fucking him. That's rape, period. Bond is raping her. That is not okay. Just because it was the 60s doesn't make it okay. Rape was still wrong back then. Pat develops what I can only describe as Stockholm Syndrome after the rape, growing infatuated with Bond to an unhealthy degree after swearing him off just minutes ago. If you try to defend this scene in the comments, you will be blocked. That was rape. That was rape. That was rape. And yes, I read the screenplay. There's nothing in it that implies it was in any way consensual. Patricia, you'll spend 10 minutes in the steam room. It'll relax you properly. Bond, sourly. You think I need relaxing after that? Wait till I tell your doctor what I think about this place of his and this broken down equipment. Patricia, you wouldn't tell him, please. I'd lose my job. There is a silence. Now he is looking at her more cheerfully again, and now he is smiling. Bond, I suppose my silence could have a price. She stares at him, and then suddenly she finds she is blushing. Patricia, you don't mean, oh no, oh no! He nods slowly, the grin on his face widening all the time. Bond softly, oh yes, oh yes. Before we move on, let's cleanse our palettes. Here is some relaxing music and footage of my parents' dog. Her name is Jacqueline, and she's a bad. on. I don't really feel the stakes in this film either. Stealing two bombs from the Royal Air Force and asking for a ransom? In this day and age, that's just a typical Tuesday. We really do live in the worst timeline. <laughs> Throughout this film, despite all the action on screen, I found myself distracted by other matters. When I was analyzing this film, I was finalizing things for my move back in February. I was thinking if I had time to watch You Only Live Twice before for moving day. I was thinking about what to do for my new set and how I would decorate my new apartment. And this isn't a level of apathy that should be instilled in your viewers. I think I had this level of apathy because this is one of the many upcoming films that follows the Bond formula to a T. 
I'm James Bond, international super spy. I'm an alpha chad and the ladies love me. I just dabbed on some rando villain in the pre credit scene by killing them. Oh, money pity, how I would like to do the sex to you. Oh, James, how I would like to do the sex to you too. 007, evil big bad guy is trying to take over the world again. It is up to you to stop him. Good luck, 007. I won't let you down, sir. I am Q, the gadget guy. Here are your gadgets. Stark, Stark, Stark. I am James Bond and I am in... Into an exotic country here. I am the first sexy lady that will fuck Bond. I will die after sex. I am the brutal henchman that rarely speaks. And I am the second sexy lady that will fuck Bond. I am evil and work for evil McBad guy. I'll die too. I am the third sexy lady that will fuck Bond. I survive. Despite all odds and many action scenes later, I save the day. Oh, Bond girl, I will do the sex to you. Oh, James, do the sex to me. We do, do the, the sex. sex. Credit where credit's due, though. The underwater scenes are beautifully shot, especially for the 1960s. And this movie has not just one, but two female MI6 agents. We have Paula Copeland, a field agent who dies before we really get to know her. But did you know there was a female double O agent? I'm not kidding. If you look very closely in the scene where all the double O agents are meeting, one pair of legs is not wearing pants, but a pair of black tights. If you dig deep enough, you'll find photographs of the agents to Bond's left. And look at that! There's a woman! Take that, liberals! Some final notes before we move on. I think the first half hour could have been cut more thoroughly. This film drags more than Twilight, and since we know the good guys will win in this movie, the stakes aren't high enough for me to care. Our main Bond girl this time, Domino Vitali, is interesting in theory. She is the mistress of Largo, the Spectre operative in charge of the whole missile stealing thing, but isn't happy in her current predicament. Sadly, not much use is made of her. Her. Sure, she kills Largo in the end, but there is little that makes her stand out along the likes of Tanya and Pussy. I did like the villain Bond girl, Fiona, though. Bond's cock wasn't enough for her to switch size, and I found that fun. Overall score, 3.3 out of 10. It's pretty to look at, but has no substance. Bond's actions in the first third made me lose all respect for him. The legal dispute was more entertaining than the film. I have no real parting thoughts for this one. It's bad. No watch it. The basic plot. After Spectre steals an American spacecraft, Bond is sent to Japan to investigate before the Cold War grows hot! This film marks the beginning of some behind the scenes changes in the Bond world. Firstly, Broccoli and Seltzman's relationship began to strain, to the point where they started an ABAB pattern of producing the movies. Broccoli alluded this to them having different attitudes on where to take the Bond franchise. Anyway, fun fact! The screenplay for this film was written by, I shit you not, Roald Dahl. Dahl was a friend of Fleming's, as racist white men tend to be, but this was the first screenplay he wrote, and his talent as an author did not translate into a good Bond film. The restrictions Seltzman and Broccoli placed on Dahl certainly didn't help matters. You can come up with anything you like, so as far as the story goes. But there are two things you mustn't mess about with. The first is the character of Bond that's fixed. The second is the girl formula that is also fixed. What's the girl formula? There's nothing to it. You use three different girls and Bond has them all. Separately or in mass? <sighs> How many Bond films have you seen? Just one, the one with the crazy motor car. You'd better see the others right away. We'll send them out to your house with a projector and someone to work in. So you put in three girls, no more and no less. Girl number one is Pro Bond. She stays around roughly through the first reel of the picture. Then she is bumped off by the enemy, preferably in Bond's arms. 
In bed or not in bed? Whatever you like, so long as it's in good taste. Girl number two is anti-bond. She works for the enemy, and she stays around throughout the middle third of the picture. She must capture Bond, and Bond must have himself by bowling her over with sheer sexual magnetism. This girl should also be bumped off, preferably in an original fashion. There aren't many of those left. We'll find one. Girl number three is violently pro-Bond. She occupies the final third of the picture, and she must on no account be killed, nor must she permit Bond to take any lecturous liberties with her until the very end of the story. We keep that for the fade out. With these restrictions, it's no wonder this Bond film is just as formulaic as Thunderball. Roland Dahl's involvement is also why I believe this was the first of seven Bond screenplays I didn't obtain, and the first of three I couldn't find at all. We'll get to the other two later. Oh, and before you ask, I don't have the other four because they were behind a paywall and <laughs> I'm broke. The plot of this film is... Odd, to say the least. Spectre's plan is basically a mix of what they were trying to do in From Russia With Love and Thunderball, but in space! Bond doesn't even go to space, though. Space was just a cool concept at the time. In 1967, outer space was a viable commercial commodity. Kubrick's 2001 A Space Oddity was in the making, as well as Planet of the Apes. America's space program was approaching a zenith. Man had recently walked in space. But... As a native Houstonian, I appreciate my hometown getting a shout out. Hello, Houston. Hawaii. We've lost all radio contact. Spectre is making spacecraft disappear on both sides of the Cold War because something something World War 3. Which, in my opinion, is over the top and repetitive. We already almost had a World War 3 multiple times. A side note, I love the idea that the Soviets would intentionally fuck with US spacecraft, which they would have no reason to do because they fucking won the space race. The Soviet Union had their first artificial satellite in 1957. They sent the first plants and mammals returning alive in 1960. They had their first human space flight in 1961. They had their first woman in space in 1963. They had their first spacewalk in 1965. So on and so forth. My Russian German roots are beaming with pride. Slava, so it's a minarodo, pioneer cosmosa. In the opening, it's clear that Sean Connery was tired of playing Bond, even after his racist first line. Why do Chinese girls taste different from all other girls? He's bloated, unmotivated, and seems to only be there for the paycheck, which he kind of was. At this point, Connery was tired of playing James Bond. He feared getting typecast because of the role. Connery was also bored doing the same thing over and over again. James Bond wasn't changing, but he was. He wanted something new. Connery's disillusionment with Bond was to the point where he was released from his six-picture contract halfway through the shooting of this movie. He was one of the most recognizable men on Earth. His then-wife recounted, Every day, the conviction had become more deeply rooted. We had to have somewhere to get away from the torment of living in such a frenzied fishbowl. What didn't help was that Connery didn't particularly like the direction the films were going. As far as gadgets like cars are concerned, fantastic volcanoes and these extraordinary things, the later films have developed and, and, and developed and gotten away from the personal aspect of the films, which I liked. Anyway, this pre-credit sequence ends with some police officers killing James Bond. Of course, the death was fake. Bond faked his death to work undetected in Japan, which... I'm sorry, but this plan is so fucking stupid. I promised myself I wouldn't go all nostalgia critic or cinema sins and nitpick every part of these films, but MI6's plan here is very confusing. Bond is going to be working with Japanese intelligence to determine the origin of the satellite that attacked the Americans. So why did he have to fake his death? He's still on the job. It's not like he's changing his identity and living a peaceful retirement a la Skyfall. Bond's not doing anything different compared to his other films. So what was the fucking point? 
A fun fact before I continue, I was a massive weeb in my early adolescence. I took Japanese in high school and my first year of college. Another fun fact, this movie used actual Japanese actors to play the Japanese characters. Most are dubbed and don't have real Japanese names, but progress, I guess? What do these things have in common? There's Japanese spoken in the film. I'm a little out of practice, but I'll try my best to show y'all how this film portrays Japanese culture and the Japanese language. The first Japanese dialogue is this roughly translates to he is here, he is coming. It's technically accurate, but the Japanese language frowns on using pronouns instead of someone's actual name, as that is seen as casual and impolite. It might be a code name though, so I'll let it slide. That's the main problem with Japanese spoken in this film and with many Western films that utilize Japanese in general. Some of it is too casual for the context it's spoken in and thus seems impolite. The Japanese language is very keen on how you say something in different contexts. For example, saying something as simple as, I want to eat dinner can sound completely different if you're talking to your best friend or your boss. So while I commend them for actually using the real language, I wish they used the right contexts. As for accuracy to Japanese culture, this film is a mixed bag. The sumo wrestling scene where Bond meets his Japanese contact, Aki, is an accurate depiction of the sport, though this scene is right before Bond meets his English contact and racism ensues. Oh, you must excuse this rather odd mixture of styles, but I refuse to go entirely Japanese. While sake is a classic Japanese alcohol, the way it's pronounced is inaccurate and proves that the lines of Tiger Tanaka, Japan's M equivalent, were dubbed. You like Japanese sake, Mr. Bond? It's sake, not sake. This film also wouldn't be an early James Bond film without your run-of-the-mill misogyny. Case in point, the bath scene. The entire scene is uncomfortable on so many levels. Like, obviously it's fan service for those who get off on pretending to be James Bond, but the orientalism of it is not ideal. Public Japanese bathing is also gender segregated, so I don't think it would traditionally involve scantily clad Japanese women and washing you, you also have to clean yourself before you get in the bath. This entire scene is inaccurate. I'd forgive it if this was just Tiger Tanaka's personal fetish, but I doubt that was the intent. This scene also has a racist stereotype, particularly the submissive Japanese woman. This one in particular irks me a lot because it's something white incels in neckbeards promulgate when shaming independent Western women. No woman, whether from the East or West, will fuck you, you creeps. Get off your gaming chair and take a fucking shower. I will admit though that the set pieces are beautiful. You can tell a lot of TLC went into designing them to make them look foreign to the franchise, but not enough to alienate 1967 moviegoers. But alas, we must talk about how over the top this movie is. I know it's a matter of personal preference, but a lot of the aspects of You Only Live Twice will later on bite the writers in the ass when it became more vogue to parody spy movies. It's also a weird addition to what is, at its most basic, a travel guide to 1967 Japan. Ian Fleming wrote the original book as sort of a travelogue to the country, but that's overshadowed by Blofeld's volcano lair and all the racism. Speaking of, let's take a look at a very weird scene in the movie. With his time to sort the missile crisis running out, Bond is taken by Tanaka to his training school of... ninjas. This is my ninja training school. Okay, they realized that traditional Japanese ninjas were mercenaries, right? They didn't work for the government, they were spies for Anyway, Bond was brought here to, in Tanaka's words, First, 
you become a Japanese. Second, you train hard and quickly to become a ninja like us. And third, to give you extra special cover, you take a wife. God, this really is a neckbeard fantasy. Hast thou learned the art of the ninja, my lady? And how does Bond become Japanese? He- OH GOD FUCK! So, um, I kept forgetting about this part of the movie. My friends had to remind me that Sean Connery spends a large portion of it in yellow face. It's very uncomfortable and I think I suppressed it. After From Russia With Love, I thought they were done with the whole non-Asians as Asians thing, but apparently not! We still had to deal with that in the year of our lord, 1967! Fucking hell! Anyway, Bond Fink marries a Japanese girl, they kill Blofeld, but not really because he returns, and they kiss the end. Now for some miscellaneous notes before my final thoughts. Aki was a great Bond girl. She's a strong, capable woman who, like Sylvia Trench, comes on to Bond herself, and they sleep together out of mutual attraction. It's a shame she's killed off. The pacing of this movie is better than Thunderball. No scene drags on for too long, and every part of the movie seems to have a point. This film only takes a few plot points from the book. Mostly the Japan setting and Spectre's involvement in the evil plan. But there is a movie later on that is a more accurate depiction of the book. But more on that later. While this film is somewhat more entertaining than Thunderball, I just can't shake off the blatant racism and sexism that persists. It does not age well, to say the least. Overall score, 3.5 out of 10. Better than Thunderball, but still bad. It's racist. Don't watch it. Before we discuss the film, let's take a step back and talk about how Sean Connery was feeling about the James Bond role at this point. He hated it. He hated only being known for James Bond, he hated the attention it gave him, and he started to hate Salesman and Broccoli. There was a specific incident during the filming of You Only Live Twice that can be inferred as the last straw. He was photographed while in the bathroom. Let's all agree that photographing anyone in the bathroom that is not yourself is a serious breach of privacy. Sometime after that incident, Connery announced that You Only Live Twice would be his last Bond film, and thus the hunt for a replacement began. Seltzman and Brockley searched long and hard before settling on George Lazenby. Lazenby was an odd choice for many reasons. Firstly, he was Australian and thus was raised far away from the British Isles. Secondly, he had no real acting experience and had only worked as a model and a used car salesman. And finally, he was nine years younger than Sean Connery, which wouldn't help with continuity, especially since people expected the talent and appearance of Connery. I felt that I had to copy Sean on Connery in a sense. Connery could just be himself and let his personality emerge. Because I was following in his footsteps, I felt that I had to copy Connery's energy. I was at a bit of a disadvantage because it's much stronger when you're being yourself. Whoever first plays the character has the advantage of establishing the energy of the character. But Lazenby's one film on Her Majesty's Secret Service is a major improvement over the two preceding it. So why am I counting on Her Majesty's Secret Service as part of the Connery era? One, Connery returns in the next film, Diamonds Are Forever, for reasons we will get to later. And two, some of the plot points in this film carry over not just in Diamonds Are Forever, but in many other Bond films. At its core, On Her Majesty's Secret Service is a love story. Yes, an actual love story. And it works! because of its strong main Bond girl and Lazenby's acting and experience working to his advantage. How? Let me show you! The basic plot. Bond covers Blofeld's latest scheme to hold the world to ransom by threatening to render it infertile. 
While Bond tries to stop him, he meets the love of his life, Teresa Tracy de Vicenzo. The opening for this Bond film is my favorite of the eras. It lures us in with M and Q trying to locate Bond, but we aren't told exactly why they need him. It adds an air of mystery to the film, especially as Blofeld's grand plan isn't revealed until much later. The new Bond is also revealed in a similar fashion to Dr. No, not showing his face and instead teasing us with his lips and his hands as he sees the distraught woman pass his car. Out of a tinge of suspicion, he follows her to a beach where she almost takes her life by drowning herself. Bond decides to save her before she can go through with it. This woman happens to be the best Bond girl out of all the ones we will be discussing today. After Bond saves her, however, he ends up getting held at gunpoint by two men, leading to the girl almost getting captured in the first fight scene. Sure, it's badly edited by 2022 standards, but the fight is more realistic than ever before, partly because Lazenby was a skilled martial artist. And this opening leaves us with several questions. Why did the girl want to end her life? Why do these men want her? Is this related to what M and Q were talking about? I want the answers to these questions and I want more of this movie so fucking badly. This intro also has the first time I laughed since Goldfinger. This never happened to the other fella. <laughs> Seriously though, I live for meta humor. <laughs> the opening is also of high quality. It's instrumental as composer John Barry thought that using the film's title in lyrics would be too operatic, but it's an intense bop that almost won my poll for this video's ending theme. The opening also has an hourglass motif symbolizing the fact that Bond is working against time in this movie to save the world, yet has all the time in the world for the love of his life. It also includes footage from all the previous Bond films as if they thought this would be the final one and pulled all the shots before they packed up and left. And to be honest, this film would have made for a great finale. God, I love this film, like unironically. I love it. One thing I like about Bond's characterization in this film is that he's vulnerable and inexperienced, relying on his instincts instead of his gadgets. Sure, Lazenby might fumble over a few of his lines. Sure, Lazenby might not be someone's idea of a suave super agent, but his ability to seem relatable and not be an out of reach agent that's perfect in every way, unlike certain interpretations, as well as his emotional performances later on the film, make me really enjoy this portrayal. Lazenby also seemed to understand the literary character. Bond's not an introspective character. Bond's just a charmer and he's efficient at what he does. He gets away with a lot of bad behavior because he's the best at what he does. You wouldn't fire him no matter what trouble he gets himself into. In a way, he's like a used car salesman, which I was. Lazenby's performance is also strengthened by the characters that surround him, such as the best Bond girl, whom we're finally introduced to, Teresa de Vicenzo, or Tracy for short. We're introduced to her in a scene that references Bond's introduction in Dr. No, a game of baccarat where Bond once again saves her by bailing her out of debt. It calls back to how Bond met Sylvia in the first film, thus showing the cycle of the Phoenix's new life. The two talk and despite some sloppy editing, it introduces Tracy as a confident yet troubled girl that is intrigued by Bond's desire to play hero. Why do you persist in rescuing me, Mr. Bond? The film also shows Tracy doing the pursuing instead of Bond. Please stay alive. At least for tonight. Come later. Another henchman gets to Tracy's hotel room first, and a fight scene commences. Fun fact, by the way, Tracy's actress was a year older than George Lazenby. I stand! 
Except for Bond smacking a lady. He has not once hit a woman. Bond and Tracy end up fucking, though, after a rather sweet scene where they make up. But Tracy is still a mystery. Who is she? Who are these men that keep coming after her and Bond? What is she running from? The henchman returns, revealing himself to have survived his fight, but leaves after overhearing Bond's conversation with Tracy. This ends up with Bond getting kidnapped and us finally learning what Tracy's deal is. Less than 30 minutes into the film, not too early and not too late, allowing for their relationship to actually grow. So the man who ordered Bond's kidnapping was Mark Ang Draco, a powerful mob boss and Tracy's father. He discusses Tracy's troubled life and how he only wants the best for her. I came to love this girl. We married. The result? Teresa. Twelve years later, my wife died. I sent Teresa to Switzerland to finish her education. Unfortunately, I didn't give her a proper home. She was without supervision. She joined a fast international One scandal after another. When I cut off her allowance, she committed some greater folly to spite me. And yet behind her bravado, something was eating away at her soul. Yes. Without telling me she married an Italian count who killed himself in a Maserati with one of his mistresses. I gave her too much and it brought her nothing. Now, why tell you all this? Draco says some sexist shit that makes Bond himself uncomfortable. He asks him to marry her. He says no, but he agrees to continue romancing her in exchange for intel on Blofeld, which was what M and Q were trying to get in contact with Bond for in the beginning. Now, granted, I disagree with the whole I can fix her trope. But Bond does have genuine feelings for Tracy and vice versa, and it's shown in a way that's not rushed or sudden. Note that the calendar in Draco's office says the Italian word for September, making this scene occur on September 13th. Draco invites Bond to his birthday party to be formally introduced to Tracy, which would be sometime between the 19th and 22nd of September. Most of the film's second half takes place in late December. The ending, which shows Bond and Tracy getting married, most likely happens in spring. This is a enough movie time for a genuine romance to grow and develop. Unable to pass up an opportunity to get intel on Blofeld, he returns to MI6, flirts with Moneypenny in a more romantic manner than before, and gets shit on by M for having no updates on Blofeld. This lack of confidence from M doesn't sit well with Bond, and he immediately decides to resign, resulting in another meta-humor scene where we not only see Bond's office for the first time, but we even see gadgets from films past and even hear a recording of Underneath the Mango Tree, which was a musical motif in Dr. No. Of course, Moneypenny isn't one for impulsiveness and changes Bond's resignation letter to a request for two weeks paid leave. This shows more character for Moneypenny compared to other films only showing her playful flirtiness. By the way, there's an instrumental motif that plays throughout the film that has great significance to the theme. We'll get to that. Tracy, dressed to the nines, seriously, I want this outfit, does indeed return for her father's birthday. Considering his attitude towards women, but she needs a man to dominate her. I wouldn't be surprised if this is the only time he sees her every year. I mean, he cares about her in a way, I guess. But still. Anyway, enough about Tracy's misogynistic father. Tracy is iconic. She's a depressed, snarky woman who dresses fabulously and manages to find happiness on her own terms by the end of the film. She's all I want to be and more. I love her. Oh, and she also immediately figures out that Draco is trying to set her up with Bond. Papa is up to something, I'm sure of it. No woman would waste this excellent champagne discussing a business deal. Unless, of course, she happened to be part of the arrangement. Tell him what he wants to know. Now. Please, please, Teresa. There's only a possibility. Nothing definite. Tell him, Papa, or you'll never see me again. 
And Tracy is flawed. She can be vindictive. She can be sour. But it stems from genuine trauma that she recovers from with the help of Bond. Bond and Tracy kiss once they're away from Draco. And they have a montage where they fall in love for real. Having time to get to know each other over a span of weeks. And you can see them grow more and more attached to each other as time goes by. And it's to the tune of We Have All the Time in the World, which is an incredible song and one of my personal favorites. Why? It's sung by the late Louis Armstrong. As a New Orleanian by birth, I give it all my love. His gritty vocals, in spite of his declining health at the time, have a vulnerability to them that fits with Bond letting his walls down and finally finding someone to spend the rest of his life with. And that jazzy tempo, I vibe to it so hard, I love it. <laughs> You also see Tracy grow happier, despite, once again, my disdain towards the love fixes someone trope. I can't help but feel happy that Tracy is getting some peace by being with Bond. Maybe because I relate to her as someone who has suffered from depression and trauma? But I digress. After the montage, Draco follows through with this promise and directs Bond to an alleged Spectre associate with documents hinting at Blofeld's location. He breaks in during said associate's lunch hour to get what he needs. I must stress that I love how grounded this film is compared to the others. In this scene, Bond uses a simple lockpick to get into the associate's office, which is followed by the only high-tech gadget in in the movie, a safe cracker that's delivered by a crane across the street that's clearly part of Draco's construction company front. The film's attention to visual details is amazing. Once Bond gets what he needs, he pays a visit to M's house, which for once shows a different aspect of M's personality that we don't get in the other early Bond films. The characterization of this film, I love it. Then again, I am a sucker for character development, as you all know. <laughs> Anyway, what's Blofeld's plan? Blofeld has been in contact with genealogist Sir Hilary Bray to claim the title of a count. However, this is a bit of a red herring. His real plan is to wipe out all plant and animal life unless he is given amnesty for all his past crimes. Since this is era one bond, said wipeout will be conducted by brainwashed beautiful young women. Not every aspect of this film is a winner, but what can I say? Side note, Bond actually learning of something rather than immediately knowing it is a breath of fresh air. Blofeld's red herring proves to have an advantage for Bond. You see, he looks similar to Hillary, so he poses as him while visiting the aforementioned scantily clad sterilization center in Switzerland. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention Blofeld's in Switzerland to evade MI6 arrest. <laughs> this center has been disguised by Blofeld and his associates Associate, Irma Bunt, as an allergy clinic where a surprisingly diverse set of girls with unusual allergies are brainwashed to do Blofeld's bidding. Irma herself is a great character, by the way. She's a vast improvement over Rosa Klebb, as partly because Irma seems to be very asexual and is very competent at her job while maintaining the persona of the strict but loving head of the clinic. Apparently, they were going to bring her back for the next film, but her actress tragically died just days after the film's premiere. Rest in peace, Il Stepat. Your contribution to Bond will not be forgotten. So Bond meets the ladies and good lord, I forgot about this costume. I'll give Bond props for wearing a kilt in December in the mountains, but this entire set is dated. When Bond finally meets Blofeld, this time played by Telly Savalas in what I consider a great performance, Blofeld, oddly enough, doesn't recognize him and immediately takes his cover at face value. I have a theory. This Blofeld is a fake and the real one is still in hiding. In the next film, Diamonds Are Forever, Blofeld makes a large number of clones to screw with Bond, so such a feat would be fitting for him in this context. Either that or he's biding his time before he can officially capture Bond. Pick your poison. After trying and failing to get Blofeld out of Switzerland to be arrested, 
Bud sleeps with the only other woman he sleeps with in this film, Ruby. Ruby's not too relevant to the main plot, so I'll keep this short. Ruby is one of the patients at the allergy clinic. She is attracted to Bond and gives him access to her room. After getting little intel on the allergy clinic steal from Blofeld, he sleeps with her in hopes of getting more information. This scene shows Bond only fucking her for the sake of getting information and not because he wants to have a genuine affair with her. It's a nice contrast from films past, especially since he does learn something Blofeld is doing to these women. Cassette number seven. Do you remember when you first came here, how you hated chicken? But all that is over now, for I have shown you how foolish it was, and your cure is nearly done. I have taught you to love chickens, to love their flesh, their voice. Yes, your cure is nearly done. And soon, I must teach you how to give them special care. I will tell you what to do, Ruby. Bond tries to seduce Ruby again for more info on Blofeld's plan, but Irma grew suspicious of him and knocks him out while posing as Ruby. This causes Blofeld to explain his evil plan, then leave him for dead, which Bond, of course, escapes through his wits. Most of the rest of the film is an extended chase sequence between Blofeld and Bond. And while it drags from time to time, the beautiful shots and novelty of skiing in Switzerland makes it so worth it. Oh, and Tracy returns. She tracks Bond down and escapes with him to a remote barn and share a tender scene together that is one of my all-time favorite scenes ever. Mm -mm. Her Majesty's Secret Service has stole my job. But there isn't anything you can do about your job at the moment, is there? No. Why are you thinking about it now? I'm not. I'm thinking about us. Tracy, an agent shouldn't be concerned with anything but himself. I understand. We just have to go on the way we are. Huh. We'll have to find something else to do. Are you sure, James? I love you. I know I'll never find another girl like you. for this place. <laughs> this, my dears, is Bond showing vulnerability. He is finally allowing himself to love someone and is willing to give up Her Majesty's Secret Service to be with Tracy. The film's implication that Bond only slept with Ruby for information helps show how truly devoted Bond is to Tracy. And once again, it shows character development. Of course, Tracy ends up kidnapped and needs to be rescued, but that's par for the course at this point. What's not par for the course is that M decides to pay Blofeld's ransom and refuses to allow Bond to go after him, resulting in him enlisting Draco's help to save the day, making the stakes all the more interesting. And at the end, 
Bond and Tracy marry on a beautiful spring day in what could have been the perfect finale for the entire franchise. Bond retires from active duty, says his goodbyes to MQ and Moneypenny, and drives off for his honeymoon with Tracy while happily discussing their future. He's clearly excited for what's to come and can't wait to spend the rest of his life with the new Tracy Bond. But... Blofeld. Blofeld. It's all right. It's quite all right, really. She's having a rest. We'll be going on soon. There's no hurry, you see. We have all the time in the world. This is one of the most emotional scenes in any Bond film ever. Bond finally decides to settle down and be with someone he genuinely loves with all his heart. However, they couldn't even be married a day before it all had to be taken away from him. The reprise of Armstrong's song, Well Beautiful, is an ironic echo of what he wanted contrasted with what he got. And Tracy, despite her tragic death, at least got to be happy, if only for a little while. She got to spend time with the love of her life, and it seems like her death was instant, so in a way, she died happy. She died happy. Overall score, 8.9 out of 10. Beautiful, heartbreaking, and amazing. A few missteps here and there, but overall, one of the best experiences I had. But alas, such greatness was not meant to be. George Lazenby decided to only do one Bond film after his agent convinced him that spy movies were out and hippie movies were in. It's a shame, but I imagine he's content with his sole contribution to the series. He acted in some smaller movies and developed a fortune in real estate. He even has a documentary about himself in post-production, but as of this taping, it hasn't been released yet. I'll certainly check it out when it does. And from looking at George's socials, he seems happy. He takes his Bond one-liners in stride and seems to be a doting parent and grandparent. I salute him. He seems like a wonderful fellow, and I wish him all the best. The basic plot, Bond impersonates a diamond smuggler to infiltrate a ring involved with Blofeld's latest scheme to take over the world, hell-bent on killing him once and for all. So, Salzman and Broccoli managed to get Connery back for one last hurrah. How? Let me explain. Broccoli and Salzman offered Connery a deal he couldn't refuse. A $1.25 million salary, a record at the time, a cut of the box office sales, and two United Artists movies of his choice to star in. Connery accepted and did a move so big it can only be described as him dabbing on the studio. He donated his entire salary to fund the Scottish International Educational Trust a nonprofit that gives financial aid to gifted Scottish students. It's still active today, and a link to its site is in the description if you want more information. But Bond was back for real with Diamonds Are Forever, Connery's last and weakest Eon film. The intro, while a good follow-up to On Her Majesty's Secret Service, is super confusing to those unfamiliar with the previous film. 
considering the initial box office revenue, that was probably the case for many people who saw the movie. It does, however, introduce the plot point I mentioned in the last movie. Blofeld uses plastic surgery to make clones of himself to stay hidden and fuck with Bond. The only difference is that Blofeld has hair and appeared as an ally and you only live twice. What a weird casting choice. It's also clear from the intro that Connery is only in it for what he was promised. He sounds tired, looks stoey, and just doesn't seem to be having a good time. The opening song, though, is the best part of the movie. Shirley Bassey kills it again, and the song is so gloriously sexual that I will make love to this song no matter what. Yes, I know that was the intent, but still. The first post credit scene tries and sets up the gambit for the film in the most racist way possible. The scent of the world's diamonds come from mines in South Africa. The whole process from start to finish operates under an airtight security system. It's an essential precaution. Even though the industry prides itself on the loyalty and devotion of its workers. Naturally, the security measures tend to ensure that loyalty, as do the extensive amenities and social services we provide. There's a permanent staff of doctors, nurses, even dentists. Given what kind of country South Africa was in the 20th century, and the way this white man is talking about the black miners, I feel like I'm listening to someone try and justify fucking slavery with all the quote worker loyalty and amenities bollocks. It leaves a bad taste in my mouth, like diamonds should, but even more so. Then we meet the only other good part of the movie, iconic gay assassin duo Wint and Kid. These two are so fucking campy, but are so good at their job. They're like the knick and knack of 1971. The queen? You simpering simpleton. Oh, well, she is the queen. Barbie as the princess and the pauper will forever be more iconic than diamonds are forever. Change my mind, you can't. But for every good in this movie, there are 15 bads. For example, the pacing is at its worst. The gambit is very hard to understand in your first watch through, and maybe even your second. It took me two watches and a reading of the film summary to get a glimpse of what's going on. Here's a TLDR so you won't share my fate. Basically, Wint and Kid are part of the diamond smuggling operation and are killing every smuggler in the smuggling ladder to cover up the tracks of quote, the boss. Bond's job is to pose as one of the smugglers in the ladder, specifically a man named Peter, to get to the bottom of what's going on. He's sent to Holland to meet the next person in the ladder and the first American Bond girl. Tiffany Case. And good lord, Tiffany was a wasted character. She was introduced as a snarky, confident smuggler who was not the man-hating troubled girl that Bond would fix in the original novel because Ian Fleming was the most divorced man to ever exist. Tiffany starts out as a competent woman and smuggler, immediately checking, quote, Peter's identity and having many disguises on hand. However, as the film progresses, she grows more and more stupid and reliant on Bond. She loses all her gusto when Connery Bond's sperm enters her precious diamond and is merely a damsel in distress by the time the endgame rolls around. The film also relies more on the action than the plot. And while I don't have an issue with good old fashioned violence, there are various plot holes in the film that are left unsolved. And the plot itself is rather nonsensical. Remember, it took me two watches to get even a clue as to what the fuck Spectre was doing with the diamonds. In fact, most of my notes for this section didn't even mention the plot, just things that happened that I thought were noteworthy. I couldn't even bring myself to finish the film when I was writing my notes. I'll prove it to y'all. Here are my remaining notes of the film in order. 
we get our fourth Felix in this film, this time played by Norman Burton. He's the worst of the bunch. Burton was too old and dad-like to portray the kindly southern gentleman Felix. He looks like he belongs in a buddy cop film, not a spy film. Plot hole one. Bond apparently used fake diamonds to infiltrate the smuggling ring, but gave Felix the real ones. How did Bond get the fake diamonds? Wouldn't it not matter if Bond just used the real ones the whole time? More smugglers are killed and Bond goes Viva Las Vegas and visits a casino owned by a reclusive billionaire that is a Howard Hughes XB. Howard, stop infiltrating my crap. I mean it. Do it one more time and I'll kill you again. Then we meet Plenty O'Toole, one of the worst Bond girls. Plenty ogles over Bond only to die after randomly going to Tiffany's house out of jealousy. Plot hole two. How did Plenty get Tiffany's address? I wanted to kill Plenty while watching this movie, but after reading a bit on her character and her actress, I think the annoyingness was intentional. I had cornered Guy Hamilton, the director, and said I'd been thinking about the character of Plenty. And I did not want to portray a hooker with a heart of gold. It's such a cliche. I wanted to make Plenty not stupid and without cunning. Her motives are clear cut. She's doing a job as if she were working in a department store. That's her attitude about her work. She's very matter of fact. The scene where Tiffany has to retrieve the real diamonds at Circus Circus is bad. It drags, drags, drags and seems more like an ad for the casino rather than an actual scene. Though I did laugh at this. I saw the whole thing. The machine's fixed. Who's she, you mother? Blow up your pants. Circus Circus also has the most racist part of the film. Yes, more racist than the slavery illusions. Meet Zambora. First time see Zambora, strangest girl ever born to live. She was captured near Nairobi, South Africa. This beautiful girl will be locked into a steel cage right in front of your eyes, will change very slowly into a ferocious 450 pound gorilla. Please be very still, ladies and gentlemen. We must have absolute silence that in every scientific experiment is always a danger. Now we start the transformation. Wake, my beauty, wake! This scene was so uncomfortable to watch. Not even getting into the racist history of referring to black and indigenous people of color as apes. Not even getting into the Yiddish stereotype presenting. The fact that a black woman is gawked at in such a racist show, and I know it probably was an optical illusion, but that does not make it okay. It's obvious that those up top knew exactly what they were doing and were too racist to even have a shred of self-awareness or empathy to think, hey, maybe we should not do the racist Zambora act. Whoever wrote this scene, fuck you! Anyway, we learn Blofeld's gambit. Bond hits a lady again. He has not once hit a woman. Blofeld is building a laser to take over the world. It's stupid. Blofeld dies. Tiffany and Bond embrace. They fuck. Went to kid die. And I was sad. The end. Overall score, 2.2 out of 10. The worst of the bunch so far. Almost unwatchable. Went and kid were iconic though. Diamonds Are Forever, Sean Connery officially retired as James Bond. He got his two movies with United Artists, though. 1972 crime drama, The Offense, and a Macbeth adaption that ended up in the can due to circumstances beyond Connery's control. He starred in a variety of other films in the 70s. Some of them were good, but many of them were bad. It would take until cult classic Highlander for him to establish a role that was iconic as James Bond. His portrayal of Juan Sanchez Villalobos Lamiles was the only other character he played more than once. He played a variety of mentor-like characters for the rest of his career. He got a knighthood in 2000, but retired from acting after being in the negatively received film adaption of The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. He passed away on Halloween of 2020 at the age of 90. 
due to complications of dementia. A tragic end to a heavily flawed but memorable actor. Oh, and before you ask about another Bond project Connery was in, we'll get to that later, don't worry. But for now, the phoenix has died and will soon reemerge anew from the ashes. Let's travel a little back in time first. Welcome everyone to the first intermission! In these bits I'll be adding between Bond eras, we'll take a look at the Bond films that didn't involve Eon, as well as maybe some other things, I don't know. <laughs> this intermission will be talking about another Bond film released in 1967, Casino Royale, aka the Bond film Done on Weed and meth. As I mentioned before, by the time Eon came into the picture, the film rights for Casino Royale were sold off, specifically to Russian-American director, producer, and actor Gregory Latov. Nothing came of this, and he died in 1960, after which his widow sold the rights to his agent, Charles K. Feldman. Feldman did nothing with the rights until he saw just how profitable the Bond films were. He approached Salzman and Broccoli with an offer to co-produce the film. Contrary to some mainstream narratives, the two did not outright reject the offer. They were in talks with Feldman for a while, but plans fell through due to financial and scheduling disputes. Pissed at not being able to make his dream movie, Feldman approached Columbia with the rights. They gave him funding, and he got Academy Award-winning screenwriter Ben Hecht on board. Sadly, Hecht died three years before the film could reach its full potential. Now, take everything you know about Fleming's original novel and toss it out the window. This film defies all logic and reason. It's also another film where the troubled production is more interesting than the final product. Feldman threw out Heck's apparently faithful screenplay and decided to make a spy spoof instead. Three people were credited with the rewrite, but it apparently had seven writers. And it shows. What doesn't help is that the film had not just one, not just two, but five directors, each with their own style. The opening is the only serious scene in the film. Here, this brunette bloke is James Bond, but not really, and he gets orders to follow someone. Roll credits! The credits animation is very well done and is one of the few good parts of the movie. It was done by... wait... The late Richard Williams? Raggedy Ann and Andy, a musical adventure Richard Williams? Who framed Roger Rabbit Richard Williams? The thief and the cobbler Richard Williams? Ha! The kitschy music is also super fucking catchy and sounds like something I'd listen to while cleaning. That's not a bad thing. Seriously, the music is unironically good. To explain the plot of this film is to explain quantum physics to an infant. It's so hard to follow that it had to be made on drugs. And there's another reason why, aside from the seven writers! That brunette bloke in the cold open? That was Peter Sellers, the original choice to play Bond in the film. Sellers accepted the role under the impression that Casino Royale 67 was going to be a serious adaption. When he learned the truth, he was pissed and was eventually fired for insubordination. As a result, new scenes had to be filmed to try and explain why Sellers only appears in like half the film. The key word here is try. A warning before we continue. My notes for this film are very disjointed. Yes, more so than my diamonds are forever ones. Trust me, this is a very disjointed film. So to help, here's a portion of the Raymond Benson book's two-page write-up on the film. Even the characters are confused. Sir James Bond, the real James Bond, lives in a huge country mansion with lions and other wild animals on the grounds. When M is killed by a bomb blast at Sir James's home, Bond decides to emerge from retirement and replace his old chief. 
James teams up with Miss Moneypenny's daughter, also called Miss Moneypenny, and proceeds to create several new James Bond 007 agents to confuse the enemy and the audience. The episodic plot is impossible to follow. That last point is so true. The plot is so confusing, even the author made a mistake in his book! He says that M had a wife and many daughters that tried to seduce Sir James. In actuality, they were agents of the enemy trying to ruin his reputation. Again, this shit is hard to follow. I'll be reading my notes almost verbatim so you have an idea of just how unhinged this is. The first scene with the real James, played by David Nevin, is an entire roast of the gadgets in the series and was one of the few things that amused me. Him and his wretched g gadgets. Well, we must make use of the weapons of our time. You, Ransom, with your trick carnation that sp spits cyanide. You ought to be ashamed. However, David Niven, of all people, playing Bond in a parody is very fitting. Not only was he buddies with Ian Fleming, but the literary Bond was written to be a David Niven fan. Fleming even wanted Niven to play Bond. <laughs> anyway, James refuses to re-enter service, so M and the other two Secret Service heads destroy his house, resulting in M's death and a very bizarre sequence where female agents of the enemy try to sleep with him while posing as M's family. Here are some highlights that make me wish recreational weed was legal in Louisiana. Just how personal is a toupee? It can only be regarded as a heirloom. According to clan tradition, when the laird dies, a black eagle must be taken alive off Ben Tarry by six barefoot virgins. Let us help you out to your daddy. Oh, no, no, thank you. I can, I can manage. Let, let... Hmm? I'm testing the temperature of the water, as I always did for my daddy. How um, old are you? Seventeen. Hereby claim my widow's due, according to Maktari tradition. Let me be comforted. James then gets chased by more female agents in a remote control car. Cool. James then goes to London and meets Moneypenny's daughter, who we'll call Moneypenny Jr. They kiss. Her actress was 23 at the time. Gross. James becomes head of MI6. He disses on his nephew, Woody Allen. I know he's James Jr., but considering what he's most known for now, it's just Woody Allen. Sex pest. Bond decides to train the spies to be celibate. Hilarity is supposed to ensue, but I'm just bored. All the agents are now named James Bond 007. Wow. Then there's racism. Not cool. You know that every fifth child born in the world is Chinese? Then we get to Vesper Lind, played by the lady who played Honey Rider. I am bored. I have stuff to do. Please let this end. Peter Sellers is retconned into Evelyn Tremble, a Baccarat expert. He is seduced by Vesper to help with whatever the fuck this gambit is. Dusty Springfield sings. It's not bad. It actually got nominated for an Oscar. Swell. They roast the gadgets again. We're only halfway through. We meet James's daughter, Mata Jr., born out of his affair with famous spy Mata Hari. Now, if you know your World War I history, you're probably thinking, wait. Wasn't Mata Hari killed in 1917 after being accused of spying? Yes! Mata Jr. becomes a spy and goes to spy school. I think the set is supposed to be a parody of the cabinet of Dr. Caligari? I don't know, when will this end? This scene goes on for a ridiculously long time. Mata Jr. gets kidnapped at the end. You finally meet Le Chief, the one good character of the film, played by Orson Welles. Welles insisted on doing magic tricks and they're iconic. <laughs> Let's get the show off the ground. <laughs> That's the, the kind of remark that leads to war. How much better for all humanity if all the nations could learn to live together in peace. Oh, marvelous, marvelous. Hooray! Oh, and by the way, 
Wells and Sellers did not get along, so much so that they had to be filmed separately. One story says that one day during filming, Princess Margaret, the Queen's sister, visited them. The Queen is still alive as of this taping, unfortunately. Sellers met her before and went up to greet her, but she straight up passed him and started to gush over Wells. Sellers was so pissed that he stormed off the set and refused to work with him again. Also, he was superstitious and hated Wells magic tricks. Long story short, everyone dies. The end. Of course, 1967's Casino Royale got negative reviews, but the fallout of this film was intense. People blamed Eon for it, wrongfully, as they had nothing to do with the film, and the film was so bad and reputation ruining that Broccoli and Seltzman swore to have as strong a grip on the Bond film rights as possible. Luckily, the shittiness of the film, as well as Eon going DEFCON 1 on any Bond films that didn't involve them, dissuaded anybody else from trying to make a Casino Royale adaption. And in 1999, Eon got the rights back. In exchange, MGM gave Sony Pictures slash Columbia the film rights to, I'm not kidding, Spider-Man. And I think we can all agree that was the best option. However, Kevin McClory refused to give up the Thunderball rights and had a very public rivalry with Eon over the matter. But more on that later. Welcome back to the 70s, everyone. It's now time to discuss the bond my parents grew up with and the one that was longest serving by number of movies, Sir Roger George Moore. Born on the 14th of October, 1927, Moore grew up as the proper Englishman Ian Fleming imagined James Bond to be, in contrast to Connery's working class Scottish glit. He got his first acting job in the strangest way possible. His father, you see, was a police detective and was called to investigate a break-in at the house of no other than Brian Desmond Hurst, most known for World War II propaganda films and some British dramas you've probably never seen. Moore's father arranged for his son to meet Desmond Hurst, resulting in Moore's acting debut as an uncredited extra. And in a move that reminds me of Ian Fleming flexing his way into naval intelligence, Desmond Hurst was so impressed by Moore that he personally paid him to go to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. He got his big break in the 60s as Simon Templar in British mystery thriller series, The Saint. I haven't seen it, but from my understanding, it's James Bond meets Robin Hood. Please correct me if I'm wrong, as I am American and don't know shit. After The Saint wrapped up and he did a couple other things, Moore was chosen to be Sean Connery's official replacement as James Bond, signing a three-picture deal in the early 70s. He had known Seltzman and Broccoli for a while, having been invited by them to a Dr. No screening. They were even in talks to get Moore to be Bond in Honor Majesty's Secret Service, but circumstances prevented that from going anywhere. Moore made efforts to make his bond different from Connery's. He drank whiskey instead of martinis, smoked cigars instead of cigarettes, and drove Lotus cars instead of Aston Martins. And y'all are pissed at the integrity of the character? If y'all can accept a whiskey chugging comedic bond, I should be able to be bond. The Moore era films are of lighter fare than the ones that came before them. Bond became more and more of an escapist fantasy, and as someone who goes to the cinema for existential dread, I had a less pleasant experience watching these. But I'm gonna bite my tongue and try and be as objective as possible. A couple notes before we continue. One, it's important to note that Broccoli and Seltzman's relationship was even more strained at this point, so much so that actress Jane Seymour recalled, Kevin Broccoli and Harry Saltzman had this huge argument right in front of me about who spotted me first. Then, one of the secretaries pulled me out of there and said, I think you better come wait out here. There were politics involved, as I later found out, and since Live and Let Die was a Harry movie, 
I only ever saw Cubby once again, which is when he invited me to his house and gave me my first glass of champagne and my first taste of caviar. This disconnect is quite obvious when comparing the problems of the first two more Bond films. Two, I don't really like Roger Moore as a person. He was a tax exile, he despised political correctness in film, and his fourth wife was from Denmark! I also read his memoir slash reflections on the franchise, Bond on Bond, and the first chapter alone makes him seem like a pretentious asshole. As I write this book, I am sitting in Monte Carlo with my wife, Christina. The sweltering sun is beating down upon us as we sip our early morning coffee, slip on our dark glasses and watch the millionaires and billionaires passing by in their designer clothes, their fast cars and on their yachts, while their luscious lady friends, our potential Bond girls, are busy sunning themselves on the terraces at the Monte Carlo Beach Club. It is a very Bondian setting in which to write a book. After I am in heart sex with my Danish wife with a smoking bud at 63, we smoked 6,000 dollars of gas and had the finest Saudi Arabian coffee and looked out across my tax exam balcony to Monte Carlo. I'm going to try and not let my opinions on Roger Moore seep into my opinions on his Bond films though. It's not productive and many of my problems with them aren't his doing. Now on with the show! Before we get to the film proper, let's discuss a cinematic subgenre called black exploitation. Black exploitation films were exploitation films with black characters and were made for a predominantly black audience, almost always written and directed by black people. They grew popular in the early 70s with iconic movies like Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song, Cleopatra Jones, and of course, Dolomite. Man, move over and let me pass. Oh, they have to be pulling these hush puppies out your motherfucking ass. These films were very profitable and were beloved by black and white audiences. So, what if a group of white people took the tropes for black exploitation films and made their own black exploitation movie, except with a white star and black villains? Ladies, gentlemen, and those in between and out of the binary, I give you Live and Let Die, or as I like to call it, Cinematic Blackface. And before you yell at me saying I'm exaggerating about this Bond film taking a lot of influence from black exploitation, not only does the film's Wikipedia page straight up categorize it as black exploitation, I'm not the only one who made this connection. Live and Let Die departs from most Bond plots by placing its emphasis on a drug-related criminal underworld, a black exploitation stable, and not on a plan to disrupt world power structures more typical of earlier Bond films. From the start, Live and Let Die changes its narrative emphasis and draws itself up along racial lines that place blackness as the primary agent of evil and whiteness as responsible for putting things back in order. As an obvious reversal of the black-white dichotomy in black exploitation movies, this conventional racial coding of protagonists and antagonists is in keeping with the return to form of the Hollywood machine, built up as it is on normative themes and easily mastered generic signals. Because Live and Let Die was released during the height of the black exploitation boom, and because part of its narrative organization responds to this cycle, the influence of black exploitation is self-evident. Where black exploitation often had its black characters sleep with white women. Bond sleeps with the black CIA agent Rosie, who turns out to be working for the villain, therefore equating a presumably good black character with villainy. The that die centers itself in the urban world, Harlem and New Orleans, which is common in black exploitation movies. This is also another one of the films where I read the book, and it's pretty racist. It was a smart, decisive bit of driving, but what startled Bond was that it had been a at the wheel, a fine looking in a black chauffeur's uniform, and through the rear window he had caught a glimpse of a single passenger, a grey black face which had turned slowly towards him and looked directly at him 
Bond was sure of it as the car accelerated towards the avenue. As Bond followed Dexter up the steps into the hotel, he reflected that it was almost certainly too late for Wee's precautions. Hardly anywhere in the world will you find a driving a car. And acting as a chauffeur is still more extraordinary. Barely conceivable, even in Harlem. But the film doesn't really follow the book. Instead of an overarching criminal organization, the villains are working alone. The aforementioned Rosie was a new inclusion to the film, and it marked the first time Bond slept with a black woman, and one of the first times such a thing was in a movie. Anyway, enough yapping! Time to watch! The Basic Plot after three MI6 agents, monetary dictator Dr. Kananga, are found dead, Bond is sent to New York to investigate and ends up in the world of the drug trade and the mysterious Mr. Big. My first note is that this film marks the return of the 5 to 3 European widescreen ratio, one of two post Connery Bond films with such a distinction. I think this is partly due to Moore's portrayal of the character being a lot less serious than the original Bond. Not just the Connery Bond, the literature Bond. Much like Dr. No, Bond himself doesn't appear in the pre credit sequence, instead showing a number of other agents getting killed by a mysterious force, one in my birth city, and one bitten by what is obviously a rubber snake. However, it's a good setting up of the rest of the film. Who are these men? Why did they die? What were they after? We then get to what is perhaps the most famous Bond song, so much so that it's played constantly on classic rock channels, and for good reason. Live and Let Die by Paul McCartney and The Wings is 100% the best theme in this era. It's so detached from the orchestral pop of prior themes that it stands out immediately. Sure, the lyrics are simple, but they're so endearing and the visuals are amazing and really show the spiritual themes of the movie. And then we finally see more Bond in bed with an Italian girl who's... 23? What? This is the first time since Dr. No that we actually see Bond's flat, and it certainly reflects his more refined tastes, particularly the espresso machine and bronze pots and pans. So let me explain why I'm not too fond of Moore's Bond portrayal. There's little to him. You know how I complained that Connery's Bond became more and more of a self-insert escapist fantasy? Moore's Bond is almost always a self-insert escapist fantasy, and that's partly because Moore didn't take the character seriously. I played it slightly tongue-in-cheek because I never quite believed that James Bond was a spy because everybody knew him. They all knew what he drank. He'd walk into a bar and it would always be, ah, oh, Commander Bond, Martini, shaken, not stirred. Spies are faceless people. To an extent, Moore is right about his interpretation of Bond not being a spy. I'll give him credit though, as he's trying to ease himself into the Bond role at this point. He's failing, but this cinematic blackface doesn't account for his actual talent. He's a good actor, y'all! There's a weird cutscene that tried to play as something Connery Bond would do, but imagining more Bond doing it makes me feel uncomfortable. The driver starts off turns pleasantly from the front and extends his hand. My name is Charlie, Mr. Bond. I... His hand is met by the barrel of Bond's Walther PDK. Charlie's face blanches. He suddenly snaps to... Oh, you want to go to Shea Stadium? The Yankees are playing a doubleheader. Smiles, lowers gun. The Mets play at Shea. The baseball season doesn't begin until April. My mistake. Then we meet the main Bond girl, Solitaire, played by Jane Seymour. And it's time to discuss how this film appropriates tarot and voodoo. Tarot does not predict the future. Tarot is intended to be used as a sort of introspection, a way to learn about your own desires. Yes, I know Solitaire is supposed to be psychic, but there are better ways for her to read the future. Palm reading, for instance, is more future telling oriented. When I was 13, I went on a field trip to the Texas Renaissance Fair. While 
while there, I ended up getting a palm reading. The lady told me to ask a question, and since I was a dumb young teen, I asked about my future with my then boyfriend. Because, let's face it, is it really dating when you're that age? And of course, if you are familiar with deep flower gothic lore, I am referring to Aaron. She read my palm and said our relationship would be short-lived, but to enjoy the moment. She also said I wouldn't get married until I was 30. I don't know why, but that. <laughs> Whether or not she predicted the future is irrelevant. What matters here is that she used palm reading and not cards to try and predict my future. Jesus Christ, that was almost 10 years ago. I'm old. But guess what? Felix is back! This time he's played by David Hedison. This is the second best use of the character, and it was so good that we will not see him again until Era 3. My one complaint is his fake-ass southern accent. No, no, don't worry. I've got the place eyeballed Why the sound that works. I guess homebrew tax him. Yes, sir, I am. We then meet our villain, Dr. Kenenga, played by the late Yafek Koto. Koto did his best with what he was given. He tried to play a racist caricature of a villain as sophisticatedly as possible. And yes, Koto did regret taking part in the film. I had to dig deep in my soul and brain and come up with a level of reality that would offset the sea of stereotype crap that the screenwriter wrote that had nothing to do with the black experience or culture. What doesn't help is that allegedly, but most likely, the villains were based off the Black Panthers. While filming Diamonds Are Forever, Live and Let Die had become chosen as the next Ian Fleming novel to be adapted because screenwriter Tom Makowitz thought it would be daring to use black villains as the Black Panthers. In New York, Bond goes to the occult voodoo shot. <laughs> and okay, my Louisiana roots are fuming right now. So, fun fact. I was born in New Orleans. I currently live in Louisiana. Let me explain voodoo to y'all. Voodoo is an often caricatured and misunderstood religion from Haiti. It's best described as a blend of Roman Catholicism and West African spiritualism. The dolls, zombies, and other sensationalized parts have little to do with the religion itself. It's not violent or scary. People just think it is because it's not a white religion. Hell, the fear was capitalized on in the cold open! Exterior, Voodoo Island Cemetery at night. Lines of exotically dressed Caribbean natives are fanned out in a semicircle around a clump of graves in a small cemetery. Some hold flaming torches. The assemblage sways back and forth to the pounding of drums in a drugged, sensuous manner. We're in the middle of a voodoo ceremony. Tarot isn't even a voodoo tradition. Tarot cards originate from Europe, and they weren't used for divination purposes until the 18th century. In case you haven't figured it out by now, Dr. Kananga is also Mr. Big, a frightening drug dealer who peddles heroin via filet of soul restaurants. Why did he need these two identities instead of having one of his associates LARP as Mr. Big? I don't know. Maybe he gets a kick out of LARPing himself. It just doesn't make sense since he's, you know, the dictator of his own island. Though speaking of our villain, it's time to talk about this film's unfortunate implications. Bond has a black CIA ally in one Agent Strutter, but all of the villains are people of color, and the things they say aren't exactly pleasing to hear. Hey man, for 20 bucks. I'll take you to a Ku Klux Klan cookout. But I'd argue that the worst implications come from Solitaire's backstory. Solitaire is a 21-year-old virgin clairvoyant betrothed to Kananga slash Mr. Big. Yafet Karto was 33 when this movie was filmed. Roger Moore was 45. It gets worse! Solitaire is used by Kananga in order to tell the future and plans to take her powers away from her once the time comes. By fucking her! Where do I start? 
A black villain keeping a white virgin hostage sounds like something straight out of David Duke's asshole. It sounds like a William Luther Pierce plot point. It's something Nazis say to each other to attempt to justify their racist bullshit. Oh, and the implications in the book were worse, believe it or not. Solitaire had an apartment to herself in the same Harlem block as Mr. Big, and she had been kept virtually a prisoner there for the past year. She had two tough n as companions, and was never allowed out without a guard. Solitaire is an extraordinary woman, Mr. Bond, Mr. Big said in the same quiet, soft voice, and I'm going to marry her because she is unique. Ian Fleming, what the fuck is wrong with you? There is one good new character in this film, though. Baron Samity, played by Jeffrey Holder. He's a hammy voodoo king that works for Kananga and may or may not have supernatural powers. He is iconic and I love him. His introduction scene alone was magnificent. That's Saturday for those of you who speak French. Who the god of cemeteries and chief of the Legion of the Dead, the man who cannot die. And yes, I fact-checked that. Baron Samadhi is the saint of death in voodoo tradition, but he wouldn't dress like the New Year's baby at an orgy. No, Samadhi is classier than that. Granted, since this is a tourist show, that's justified, I guess. So Bond ends up going to San Monique, the made-up Caribbean island that Dr. Kananga is in charge of. There, we get another sequence similar to Dr. No. Bond checks his hotel room for bugs before going off and doing something benign, this time shaving in his bathtub. Then the enemy sneaks a venomous animal, this time a real snake, where was it before? Into Bond's room, and Bond kills it with prejudice! I think this is the closest the film gets to humanizing Bond. Bond, him doing a mundane activity while on assignment. Sure, we didn't need to see Bond shave, but seeing our heroes do ordinary things makes them, at least to me, more three-dimensional and human-like. A lot of people shave after all. I'm one of them. We then meet our first black Bond girl, Rosie Carver, played by Gloria Hendry. Sadly, she's a double agent for the enemy and is the stereotypical paranoid woman. Is this progress? Aside from the sex scene, no. Mrs. Bond, I presume? I'm Rosie Carver. I guess I have a little explaining to do. Custom 38, Smith & Wesson. Corrugated three-inch stock, no serial number, standard CIA issue. Question is, why point it at me? The man who delivered your champagne is not a hotel waiter. I was just trying to be careful. Yeah, no time to die does this scene a lot better. Well, that's not the first thing I thought you'd take off. But, uh... Yeah. You seem like a man who's gagging for some action, Mr. Bond. Shall we cut to the chase? I'm here as a professional courtesy. Well, you're not very courteous, are you? I know I shouldn't be comparing this to a movie I'm not even discussing today, but come on! Anyway, we're gonna fast forward a bit because I have little to say about the next 15 minutes. Here's the TLDR. We learn Rosie is a double agent. She's killed by Kananga's robot scarecrow camera. We meet Quarrel Jr., the son of the guy from the first film, and that's about it. The Live and Let Die book was published before Dr. No, so the real Quarrel was introduced in the former. Since Quarrel dies in the first Bond film, they had to make Quarrel Jr. Okay, there is one thing I will gripe about here, and that's the misinterpretation of a tarot card around the 45 minute mark. Solitaire sends Bond an upside down Queen of Cups as a warning that Rosie is not what she seems, and he uses this against her. The Queen of Cups means in an upside down position, a deceitful, perverse woman, a liar, a cheat, and I'd like some answers now. Okay. First of all, nice detail having 007 on the backs of the tarot cards. But second, that's not necessarily what an upside down, or as it's more commonly referred to as reversed, Queen of Cups means. 
The Queen of Cups reversed suggests that you stop all efforts to dull your pain or distract yourself from it. Looking the other way is not going to help you anymore. Neither is trying to rationalize away or control the situation. You must be emotionally honest. Be honest with yourself and others who may be involved in what you are going through. If you continue to anesthetize the hurt, it won't rise up to the surface and be released. Coping strategies that rely on distracting yourself from reality only serve to entrench the problem. Hell, even Solitaire is reading her cards wrong. Every time she tries to read the future after meeting Bond, she pulls the lover's card. Now to normies, that implies that Solitaire and Bond do indeed become lovers, but that's not what the card represents. Although it has taken on a strictly romantic revision of meaning in some modern deck, traditionally the lover's tarot card reflected the challenges of choosing a partner. At a crossroads, one cannot take both paths. The images on this card in different decks have varied more than most because we have had so many ways of looking at sex and relationships across cultures and centuries. Classically, the energy of this card reminded us of the real challenges posed by romantic relationships, with the protagonist often shown in the act of making an either-or choice. To partake in a higher ideal often requires sacrificing the lesser option. The path of pleasure eventually leads to distraction from spiritual growth. The gratification of the personality eventually gives way to a call from spirit as the soul matures. Why does this movie fail to understand basic tarot? A content warning before we continue. I'm going to be discussing a scene in the movie involving dubious consent. It's not straight out assault, but the circumstances are very, very blurry. Skip to the following timestamp if such discussion makes you feel uncomfortable. Kananga ends up getting pissed at Solitaire for Bond not being dead yet, and he gets really creepy towards her. Your power exists to serve me and it is mine to control. If and when the time comes, I decide you are to lose it. I myself will take it away. Remember, he's talking about fucking her. Bond tracks down where Solitaire is and ends up talking her into sleeping with her by using her cards against her. The cards say we will be lovers. You're mistaken. It's impossible, forbidden for me. But you do believe. I mean, really believe in the cards. They have never lied to me. Pick one. You knew the answer before it was given. Strangely enough, somehow. So Bond used a stacked deck that only had lover's cards in order to bang Solitaire. He tricked her into sleeping with him. Make of that what you will. Anyway, Bond's come make Solitaire lose her powers and see the light, and they decide to go to New Orleans to escape Kananga. Also, at this point, we learn what you probably already know. Kananga and his cronies are peddling drugs to the States. Cool. Our dubious lovers go to New Orleans, almost get captured, and make it to the French Quarter, where Kananga's drug front, Filet of Soul, resides. So, during the production of this video, I went to New Orleans. It was because my mom was writing in a Mardi Gras crew, but I also went to see some of the sights from Live and Let Die. Also, my uncle wanted a cameo in this video, so here he is. You're in the video now, Jimmy. Am I? Yeah. Is this a uh, flower gothic video? Yeah. <laughs> What's up? Shout out to uh, all flower gothic people. Click like and hold on, wait, look. Click like and subscribe. <laughs> Coincidentally, his name is also James. But I was on a mission. I wanted to see where the New Orleans Filet of Soul was, and I found it! It was... underwhelming. Wow. Wow. <laughs> it was 
wasn't a very populated area of the French Quarter, and no one even noticed me filming what was essentially an empty building, but I guess that's why they chose this setting. Anyway, here's another highlight of that trip. I don't know what you've been through in life, man, but look, Jesus has the best for you, bro. Jesus has a guy coming! Bond gets captured in the Filet of Soul, and we learn what we already know. Kananga is Mr. Big. He finds out that Solitaire has lost her power and sends her to be sacrificed. We also learn Kananga wants a monopoly on the heroin trade. Cool. Moving on, then we get an actually well-shot speedboat chase through the Bayou des Alamans. It's much more fast-paced than the underwater scenes in Thunderball, and it had a couple moments where I laugh. It's also where we meet average Louisiana white trash sheriff J.W. Pepper, who is about as racist as all the other Louisiana state police officers. Also, the name is funny for Texans like me who took music-inclined extracurriculars in school. <laughs> Bond burns the heroin farms, saves Solitaire, and we learn that Baron Semity survived an earlier death and is immortal. The end! This film was uncomfortable to watch. It's a poor white man's job of black exploitation and is, as I've said before, cinematic blackface. The opening song was great, the editing was clean, but neither of those rectify the core problems of the movie. Sure, it's technically less racist than the book counterpart, but that's not saying much. J.W. Pepper is funny and openly and justifiably mocked, but that isn't saying much. The acting was solid, but that does not make the movie good. Overall score, 2.5 out of 10. Cinematic blackface, not fun. Watch a real black exploitation film instead. The basic plot. Bond is sent after the Solex Agitator, a machine designed to rectify the energy crisis. Because that was a thing in the 70s. Meanwhile, assassin Francisco Scalamanga is out for his blood, and we don't know why. And now we get to the final James Bond film with Harry Seltzman co-producing, The Man with the Golden Gun. Sadly, it is the weakest of the Mormont films, so much so that during my initial watch, I just had it on as background noise to do my laundry by the halfway point. So, what went wrong? Let's find out! We start by meeting our Catalonian antagonist, Scalamega, played by Christopher Lee- GOD DAMN IT! They couldn't find a Spanish actor for this? Was the budget wasted on bringing iconic character J.W. Pepper back? Oh yes, he's back! For no reason, except that guy Hamilton liked him, apparently. Well, bringing J.W. Pepper back was pretty corny, but he was such a lovable character we thought we'd have him again. In the cold open, Scaramanga kills this American gangster who was sent to kill him over a bounty, and we see this film's main weapon, a golden gun. Yeah, the gun looks like spray-painted plastic, but it was 1974. I'll let it go this time. I must stress though, I do like Scaramanga as a character. Christopher Lee plays him like a lovable villain, which he's quite talented at. I mean, he played Dracula and the kids were all over that, I think, maybe? Oh well. Scaramanga is a worthy opponent of Bond. He's the dark XB of Bond, in fact. He has Bond's charm, suave, and sharp shooting experience, but instead of using it for queen and country to kill villains, he uses it for his own benefit and kills people for the hell of it. We then get to the opening song, which is a bop, but the lyrics are eh at best. It's just a humble brag about Scaramanga and his abilities, which we already established in the cold open. Bond then once again explains Scaramanga's deal, but this time with a twist. Chum, drink it. It even has my number on it. Precisely. Well, obviously it's useless as a bullet. I mean, sir, who would pay a million dollars to have me killed? Moreover, this trinket, as you call it, was sent with a note requesting special delivery to you. It's initialed with an S. 
Scaramanga's fingerprints were on it. Scaramanga also has three nipples, but that's not important right now. What's important is that allegedly someone ordered a hit on Bond. What does this mean? I'm relieving you of your present assignment. The energy crisis is still with us. I respectfully submit that finding Gibson and his solar cell data is even more important than ever. It is indeed. And I can't jeopardize it or any mission. Take your guesses on if the energy mission is connected to Scaramanga! It is. That's the gambit. Scaramanga wants to use the Solex Agitator to take over the world or some shit and only wants to kill Bond when he interferes with his plans. It's a needlessly complicated plot that's not at all improved by the characters. Even Bond flirting with Moneypenny doesn't help. Moneypenny, you are better than a computer. In all sorts of ways. Bond attracts one of Scaramanga's bullets to Belut, where a belly dancer took it and made it her belly button ring. They bang. Bond steals the bullet. The dirty talk is garbage. You really do have a magnificent abdomen. One pointless fight scene later, Bond gives the modified bullet to Q, who traces it to a Portuguese weaponry dealer in Macau. Said dealer is played by an Anglo-Indian man, but the Q scenes are at least funny. So Bond goes to Macau to track this dealer down, but he's stupid enough to not learn Portuguese or Cantonese. Isn't that important if you're supposed to do work in Macau? Now is the time to bring up another gripe I have with the Moore era. Everyone seems to know who James is. James Bond. An unexpected honor, Mr. Bond. Your reputation precedes you. This way, please. Bond? James Bond? Do I know the gentleman? Well, he knows you. Without being immodest, there's hardly anyone in this part of the world who doesn't. He's like a living legend. People in Live and Let Die knew his name. But like, isn't that the opposite of a secret agent's point? You can't be discreet if you're fucking recognized all the time. Another problem I have with this movie is the humor. It might be because I'm cultured as fuck, but the humor is too juvenile for my tastes. I oh, mean precisely at your groin. So speak or forever hold your peace. Part of this stems from the films growing more family friendly as time passed. Tom Mankiewicz, who co-wrote the screenplay for the film, said in an interview, During my time writing Bond, Bond was becoming more like a Disney picture. The audience just loved it. So the pressure was on to get more and more stuff. But Bond should have remained the same. It became more of a family movie. I'll TLDR this scene for y'all. Bond flexes his way into forcing this dealer to tell him how he ships Scaramanga's golden bullets. This leads him to a Macau casino. Yeah, Skyfall did this scene a lot better. So much so that my copy of this film crashed when this scene played. That's not me. That's the quality of the film revealing itself. A lady takes the bullets and Bond shadows her to Hong Kong, where we meet, oh God. So, um, this is Mary Goodnight, the worst Bond girl. Remember how I was nonplussed by the more incompetent and useless of the Bond girls? Well, well, Mary is worse. She's a dumb blonde. The kind of blonde that makes me wish I was a natural brunette. Also, her actress made some choice comments about the idea of a woman playing Bond. Absolutely not. Why not? It's, it, because it's written as a man. It's, it's an, a British institution, a British male institution. We can't change that. There's no need to change it. You, you dare question my power, mortal? Also, also, the implication is that Bond and Mary were former lovers, which is dropped immediately because the writers decided to have too many plots. Bond continues to shadow the lady who took the bullets and, oh God, is he going to do what I think he's going to do? Good afternoon. So Bond questions Andrea for her association with Scaramanga, leading to yet another uncomfortable scene. He has not once hit a woman. Let me 
play by play this for y'all. Bond breaks into a lady's hotel room and assaults her for information. This could have been done a lot better. Like, you know, fake a meet cute at a hotel bar? The Living Daylights played this a lot better. I met you play at the conservatoire yesterday. It was exquisite. Where did that take you? KGB headquarters. They released me this morning. Take a look across the street. They let you go so they could follow you. One little person choke later, because get it? Scaramanga's assistant is a little person! Bond gets arrested by a Lieutenant Hip. But surprise, surprise, it's Hong Kong intelligence. Jesus fuck, why does everyone know Bond? Bond tries to pretend to be Scaramanga to get intel from High Fat. But surprise, surprise, High Fat knew who he was all along. He still invited him to dinner though, albeit to kill him. So Bond's Hong Kong contact drives him to the dinner and oh shit, I forgot about these two. These are Hip's nieces. They know karate because of course they do. I'll give y'all a TLDR of what comes next. Bond is captured and taken to High Fat's Kung Fu Academy of Death! Hip and his nieces rescue him by using their karate skills and escape via Sampan. It plays like a Hong Kong action comedy and not a spy movie. I did not come here to watch Shaolin Soccer. Though that would be a superior viewing experience right now. Bond makes his way into town and hey, look who's back! Iconic Louisiana Sheriff J.W. Pepper! To be honest, I find the usage of a racist white sheriff of the Louisiana State Police funny in a meta kind of sense. While writing this video, the actual Louisiana State Police was under investigation for the death of a black motorist, Ronald Green, while in custody, which was allegedly, the most likely, race motivated. I think the Department of Justice got involved. Like, it, it's a, it's a mess. <laughs> Pepper does have one funny line though. I just gotta have me one of those cute little elephants. Elephant? They're Democrats, Maybell. So let's fast forward to Scaramanga and High Fat meeting once again. Fat outlived his usefulness and is thus killed by Scaramanga's IKEA golden gun. As a result, Scaramanga has the Solex. Bond then admits to Mary Goodnight that he wants to fuck her. We're only halfway through at this point. So, this film took me three days to analyze, and I ended up skipping over some parts. I watched it all the way through once, and your goth mother has better things to do than to do that again. So I'll spare all the boredom. Andrea reveals to Bond that she wants him to free her from Scaramanga. They fuck. Then she dies. Bond gets the Solex. He gives it to Goodnight. Goodnight does a stupid and gets captured. Bond steals J.W. Pepper's car to go after Scaramanga, resulting in this iconic bit. <laughs> Scaramanga's car turns into a plane. Bond flies to the island. They dine. They duel. Scaramanga dies. Bond seduces Goodnight. The end. This film is the worst of the Moore era. There are no stakes. There's nothing to keep me invested. The acting was all right, but that's the only good I can say about it. Overall score, 1.3 out of 10. Boring, bad, boring and bad. Don't watch it. The basic plot. Nuclear submarines on both sides of the Iron Curtain disappear without a trace, and Bond is sent to find out what happened. He is forced to team up with his Soviet equivalent, Agent Triple X Anya Amasova, but they grow closer as the mission continues. After two blunders, they finally did it. They made a good more Bond movie, though it apparently took a troubled pre-production to bring it to life. Before we begin, let's check in on Broccoli and Seltzman's relationship. Ah! Harry Seltzman and Producer
particular wasn't happy. He wanted to branch out beyond Bond and had been trying to do so for a while. He made a couple films on his own, but none of them were particularly memorable. One film of note was the sci-fi musical Tomorrow, starring Olivia Newton-John, which was so unsuccessful that it only had a few screenings in the 1970s, then was lost for decades. It's on YouTube if you're curious. I might do, like, something on it one day. Because of these films and other circumstances, Seltzman was in a load of debt, forcing him to borrow money from Broccoli and their holding company made to fund the Bond films, Dan Jack. Apparently, Salzman put up his Dan Jack shares as loan collateral, resulting in such a clusterfuck that Salzman ended up selling his shares in the company to United Artists, leaving the company and only producing a small handful of films until his death in 1994. So, with Salzman out of the picture, Broccoli enlisted his stepson, Michael G. Wilson, to help produce. He even got his then 17-year-old daughter, Barbara, a job doing publicity for the film. These names will be important later, so you better remember them. There was also difficulty in producing a screenplay. Fleming only sold the title rights to The Spy Who Loved Me, as he despised the book's quality. So the plot had to be developed from scratch. It went through multiple drafts. They wanted to reintroduce Spectre into the canon, but Kevin McClory threatened to sue. Roughly decided it was easier to take the L and make new villains. The film itself is, at its core, an updated retelling of You Only Live Twice, but with major improvements. There is a strong Bond girl who stays alive, no weird Japanese stereotypes or Orientalism, and Jaws! Jaws is the most iconic Bond character of the 70s. I love him so much. The start of the film is similar to You Only Live Twice, just with submarines. And titty! in my James Bond film? It's more common than you think. So the Soviet and British submarines suddenly disappear and we don't know why. Instead of meeting Bond first, we meet KGB agent Triple X Anya Amasova, played by Barbara Bach. She's making out with her male lover, her legit lover I'll add, and not just a fling. This will be important later. Anya is a well-written female counterpart to Bond. She's sensual, a star agent, and was so good at her job that they tried to get the actress back for future films. She declined. And yes, triple X, XXX, I know. But we just had to withstand high fat. I'm laying it slide. Anya is summoned to the main office and her lover is sent to Austria. And then we get to see Bond seducing a different KGB agent. After being summoned to the main office, just like Anya, Bond is chased by a group of KGB skiers, one of which being Sergei Basov, the man Anya was fucking earlier. How did he get to Austria in record time? Movie magic, don't question it. The ski chase scene is well done. There's little usage of green screen, thus allowing the action to look a lot more fluid, and the use of colorful ski clothes help the people stand out against the snow. The camera angles are sharp and add to the tension. Bond shoots and kills Sergi. See, I told you he was important! And almost, almost falls to his death. But then, we get one of the most well-known and parodied Bond stunts. This was executed perfectly. The silence after the fall makes us wonder, are they actually going to kill him? Do they have the balls to kill him? And then, the Union Jack parachute is revealed triumphantly! It's amazing, and I get why it's parodied, like, all the time. 
Then we get to the opening. Nobody does it better. It's a fitting theme for what will happen in the movie. Bond and Amasova fall in love with each other, or as much as possible for a 70s Bond film. Oh yeah, by the way, the spy refers to Bond and me refers to Anya, just FYI. <laughs> we then cut to the obligatory scene with Bond and M, but in communist Russia with Anya and Russia's M, General Gogol, instead. It's a smart use of the same dynamic M and Bond have, but in a completely different setting with their communist counterparts. It shows that Russia and the UK are different, but the same. Russia has their own agents, their own intelligence, and their own questions that need answering. Anya also learns of Sergei's death, to which she responds accordingly. Please keep me informed, Comrade General. I should very much like to meet whoever was responsible for his death. I also want to point out that General Gogol seems to genuinely care for Anya, giving his condolences and telling her everything he knows about Sergi's death. It's a nice contrast to the tough love M usually gives Bond. Speaking of Bond, we then get the same scene in the UK on a naval ship because remember, this is a redo of You Only Live Twice. The only thing of note here is that this marks the first appearance of Admiral Martin Hargreaves, played by Robert Brown. I only bring this up because after this film, Bernard Lee had only one last stint as M. He sadly died in 1981 due to complications from cancer. So, in 1984's Octopussy, M was recast to Robert Brown. There's a fan theory, one I believe, that says the new M in Octopussy is a promoted Admiral Hargreaves. Hargreaves only appears in The Spy Who Loved Me, and there's no hint of him dying in this film or any of the other ones. And considering there would be a canon, M dies and a different character is promoted to the new M later on, this is very possible. Both Anya and Bond are sent to Cairo to go after a microfilm, one that contains a highly advanced submarine tracking system. But then we meet our not Spectre, please don't sue Kevin villain of the day. It's this buckaroo, Carl Stromberg, played by Carl Jurgen. He's been stealing submarines on both sides of the Iron Curtain to trigger World War III like Blofeld. Unlike Blofeld though, Stromberg's reasoning is bizarre. Basically, he wants to restart human civilization in the ocean. Granted, in this day and age, billionaires wanting to create ocean civilizations are a dime a dozen. But I don't think any of them do it through global nuclear war. Sure, they think war is good for business, but you can't inhabit the ocean if it's, like, irradiated, you know? I'll give Jurgen credit. He plays this villain as a sophisticated madman, and he's working with an incredibly weird gambit. You can't make silver out of shit after all. And I did enjoy the usage of Movement 2 of Mozart's Piano Concerto No. 21 as his submarine emerged from the ocean. Then, Stromberg introduces his henchman, and yes, yes, it's Jaws time, yay! Yes, he's a voiceless, invincible henchman, just like Oddjob, but he's also 7 foot 5 and has metal teeth. Take that, liberals! I'd also consider him a more comic threat than Oddjob. While Oddjob was menacing and always behind Bond's back, Jaws is silly and more like one of the lighter portrayals of the Joker. Oh, and did you know he has a backstory? He has a backstory! Jaws' real name is Zbigniew Krzyczewiecki. Born in Poland, the product of a union between the strongman of a traveling circus and the chief wardress at the women's prison in Krakow. The relationship and subsequent marriage had been a stormy one, and when it broke up, the young Zbigniew stayed with his mother and attended school and subsequently university in Krakow. He grew to a prodigious height, but in temperament he followed his father and was surly and uncooperative, given to sudden outbreaks of violent temper. Because of his size, he commanded a place in the university basketball team, but he was sluggish of reaction and his lack of speed was constantly exposed by more skillful but less physically endowed players. 
After a failed attempt at a basketball career, Krzyzewicki was arrested by the secret police for having taken part in the fictitious 1972 bread riots. While he was imprisoned, the police beat him with hollow steel clubs encased in thick leather until they thought he was dead, leaving his job broken beyond repair. Krzyzewicki later escaped and stowed aboard one of Stromberg's vessels. Eventually he was caught, but instead of turning him in, Stromberg hired a prestigious doctor to create an artificial jaw. After 14 operations, Krzyzewicki's jaw was restored using steel components that created two rows of terrifying, razor-sharp teeth, although Jaws was left mute. So yeah, a lot of thought went into him. He even gets a well-deserved redemption arc in the next film. But more on that later. Bond goes to Egypt and... Okay, first of all, why are they in rural Egypt? Shouldn't Bond be in Cairo? And second, this scene reads problematically. The heat haze shimmer gradually becomes less until we establish two Arabs riding camels along a ridge of sand outlined against the blue Egyptian sky. In a close shot, we see that the rider of the first camel is Bond, in full Lawrence of Arabia garb. An Arab guide is the second camel behind him. The scene is straight out of the Arabian Nights. Cushions, rugs, a hubble bubble, bowls of dates and sweetmeats, guards with scimitars. Sprawled on a pile of rugs is Sheikh Hussein, a swarthy, handsome Arab in a romantic costume. Behind him are arranged four Arab beauties in flimsy robes and yashmaks. Also, I don't think this is how Egyptians dress. Just a hunch, especially if they're working for Englishmen. Here's a TLDR of the next few minutes. The Sheik Larper tells Bond who his contact is in Cairo, as where as will he meet the contact for the contact. Bond then fucks, uh, uh, um, moving on. So he finally gets to Cairo and tries to meet the contact of the contact, Aziz Fekish, who is played by a Jordanian. Good job! But Jaws and his assistant get to him first. Bond kills the assistant and then fucks off to the pyramids. We learn at the pyramids that Fekish was meeting with Anya Amasova for the very same reason. But before we can learn anything else... JAWS DESTROYS THE BETA FECKISH WITH FACTS AND LOGIC! But this murder had a purpose. Bond got the intel he needed on the actual contact and finally meets Amasova, and are shown to be legends in their respective agencies, and thus they know quite a bit about each other. The lady will have a Bacardi on the rocks. For the gentleman, vodka martini, shaken, not stirred. Touché. So, I guess they just dropped the whole whiskey thing, huh? This is also a rare moment where Morbont shows any vulnerability, cutting Anya off when Tracy is mentioned and changing the subject. It's a rare glimpse into the heart of the character, and I welcome it with open arms. The two also have clear chemistry, and I can see why they wanted Barbara Bach back. This level of sheer sexual tension won't be repeated until much, much later down the line. We then get to meet the main contact, a white guy LARPing as an Egyptian. He dies after the first scene as he's killed by Jaws for the microfilm, so this embarrassment doesn't last long. What is important though is that our star-crossed lovers end up in the middle of nowhere while trying to get the microfilm out of Jaws's clutches. They end up escaping him through using the car he came with, but Anya struggles with the controls. You can easily interpret the scene as a sexist take on woman drivers, but the truth is, the scene was entirely unplanned. Barbara Bach really did have trouble with the car, and Morris quips were entirely unscripted. Would you like me to drive? And yes, the scene itself is suspenseful and entertaining. They even got the microfilm! Sweet! Their car doesn't work the entire way, though, but they find a boat merchant willing to take them back to Cairo. While sailing to the city, Bond looks through the microfilm before attempting to flirt with Anya, which she seems receptive to at first, but she's not having Bond's chauvinist bullshit and drugs him. Iconic! She also steals the microfilm from him. Double iconic! Hell, almost everything Anya does is iconic. Not only is she based as fuck, but 
but she also has to make Bond work for her love. Granted, they do end up fucking by the end, big shot considering that has happened in almost every Bond film to this point, but still, there are choice shots throughout the film that show Anya maybe, just maybe, is beginning to feel something for Bond, but wasn't quite ready to commit until... This results in an entertaining fight scene where Bond is pummeled by this strong man before literally kicking him off the train. It's well shot and one of the best parts of the movie. Oh, and Joss survives because of course he does. But alas, this rescue renders Anya no longer able to hide her feelings and the two fuck before heading to Sardinia to pose as a marine biologist and his wife. Bond flirts with Stromberg's assistant because of course he fucking does, though I'm not too keen on Anya's response to it considering the fact that they've only had sex once at this point. While the two are disguised to try and gain intel on Stromberg, Stromberg immediately sees through their bullshit and orders their deaths, resulting in a glorious car chase with one of the most glorious stunts ever. No, not that one! This one! But alas, Anya Asova learns that Bond killed her lover, and she vows to avenge him once the mission is over. I will kill you. This scene is very well executed. Moore is surprisingly serious and cold once he admits to killing Sergi, and while Anya's rage is subdued, her reaction is entirely appropriate. Like, the man she fucked killed her actual fucking lover! That's fucked up! Like, come on! You would do the same in this situation! They are granted boarding on an American submarine to get a closer look at Stromberg's plans. And of course, the men have to be weird about her. I hadn't expected you to be a woman. Aboard this vessel, Commander, I am Major Masova of the Russian Army. Yeah, sure. The submarine is captured, and our leads finally learn what I've told you before. Karl Stromberg, World War III, etc. Y'all know how well this will go for him. <laughs> Anya, to some extent, forgives Bond for murdering Sergi once Stromberg is confirmed dead. The two sleep together, again much to the chagrin of their bosses. This results in one last quip from Bond. Bond, what do you think you're doing? Keeping the British end up, sir. <laughs> This film is one of the two Roger Moore Bond films I had a genuinely good time watching. Many times I'm either uncomfortable, pissed, or just bored while watching these, but The Spy Who Loved Me is actually worth watching at least once. It's entertaining, certainly the least sexist of the 70s Bond films, and is an all-around good romp, especially for Jaws! However, it isn't perfect. Stromberg's plan is unnecessarily complicated and too over the top in comparison to the more grounded plot of Anya and Bond working together. The chic scenes were uncomfortable. The plot, though better, was still recycled from You Only Live Twice. But at the end of the day, it's alright. I'll forgive it. Overall score, 7.2 out of 10. Flawed, but fun. I wish they could have brought Anya back for other films. Seriously, she was amazing. <laughs> So, y'all saw how much I liked The Spy Who Loved Me, right? The producers saw how loved the film was as well, and conceived a plan for the next one. What if we remade The Spy Who Loved Me, but worse, and in space? Okay, they were going to do an adoption of For Your Eyes Only. And then a small indie film got released in 1977 and... Okay, yeah. Star Wars happened and Eon decided to get all in on the space fun and did Moonraker instead. And no, the original Ian Fleming novel had nothing to do with space. They ripped the title off and almost nothing else. <laughs> Apparently though, Broccoli et al claimed Moonraker was not a science fiction film and that it was all scientifically accurate. Well, they did 
Tulsa in on an advisory basis, I don't think it's entirely scientific. Just a hunch. One thing of note is that this film was directed by Lewis Gilbert, who also directed You Only Live Twice and The Spy Who Loved Me. Christopher Wood wrote the screenplay, and he also co-wrote The Spy Who Loved Me. John Glenn edited both films. Me thinks Eon wanted lightning to strike twice. And it kind of did. Moonraker was the highest grossing Bond film of all time until Goldeneye. But is Moonraker worth your precious time and money? Let's find out! The basic plot. After a space shuttle mysteriously disappears, Bond is sent to investigate, leading him to eccentric billionaire Hugo Drax and a huge conspiracy. The first part of the opening is basically You Only Live Twice, but with a Boeing 747 with a shuttle instead of whatever it was Blofeld stole. Except this time, the shuttle is taken alone! The plane is left for dead, leaving Bond to once again stop fucking a lady to save the day. A fun plane fight scene follows before <gasps> Jaws! Yes! He's back! It's Jaws time, baby! The rest of the intro is just Bond stealing this unarmed henchman's parachute. It's well shot for a late 70s film, but I can't help but wonder if this is just a repeat of The Spy Who Loved Me's opening. Also, Jaws landing in a circus tent and destroying it made me laugh. <laughs> We then get to the surprisingly ethereal Moonraker theme, the third and final Bond theme sung by Shirley Bassey. It's easily the highlight of the movie. It has that seriousness I crave in movies, and the style of the opening is pretty too. Our first post-opening credit scene, aside from a brief encounter with Moneypenny, is Bernard Lee's final role as M. It's bittersweet, especially since he clearly aged between Bonds 10 and 11, but Lee is as good as ever delivering a verbal beating to Bond. Like this? Oh, thank you. Bond then flexes his knowledge on what happened in the cold open, which we already went over so I won't repeat it. Bond heads to California to investigate the shuttle's disappearance. There, we meet the scantily clad Corinne Dufour, who Bond immediately wants to fuck before meeting Hugo Drax. Welcome to California, Mr. Bond. I like it already. I must confess. In 2022, seeing a billionaire with a space fetish isn't even surprising anymore. I'm not blaming the movie for this. I'm sure they didn't predict Elon Musk and his apartheid emeralds. But even then, the plot is just a knockoff of the spy who loved me. The villain wants to restart civilization via max extermination. The main Bond girl is an agent who reluctantly teams up with Bond. Jaws kills people. It's worth it, I guess, if you want to see James Bond in space! But James Bond isn't even human here. He returns to that cardboard cookie cutter fantasy everyone in the target audience wants to be. However, I will give this movie a compliment. When they introduce Hugo Drax, they show him playing one of my all-time favorite piano pieces, Chopin's Raindrop Prelude. It establishes Drax as a man of culture, and the song itself is meaningful in this context. The Raindrop Prelude, in and of itself, is a blend of opposites. It's major and minor, a dream and a nightmare, and it represents Drax's two-sidedness. He seems like an affable villain, but but he is actually the most cruel of them all. He wants Bond to die a painful death for his own amusement. He drops his associates without even blinking. He's genuinely scary. And his actor, Michael Constale, was the perfect choice for the role. I will also applaud this movie for its lack of yellow face and brown face. Drax's Chinese henchman, Chang, is played by Japanese former actor, Choshiro Suga. Manuela, Bond's Brazilian contact, 
later in the film is played by a Ruben actress, Emily Bolton. Neither actor is in the film for particularly long, but still. Then we meet Holly Goodhead, this film's Anya Amasova. Firstly, her actress, Lois Childs, is from Houston, to which I stand. Granted, Lois Childs is a little too monotone for my taste, but she is shown to be very intelligent, and her snark in that bond is epic. The moment the pressure gets too much for you, release the button and the power's cut off. Just like that? Come on, Mr. Bond. A 70-year-old can take three Gs. A lot of the pre-space sequences were a blur to me. Bond almost gets killed by Chang, he hunts with Drax, Corrine Dufour gets killed by Drax's hunters, and then Bond goes to Venice. And herein lies the main problem of this movie. You have to pay attention to every last word. It's easy to miss why Bond is in these exotic locations, but there is dialogue that explains it for you, and that's not how to make a good movie. If it's relevant to the plot, then your audience should be able to figure it out without googling it. So let me explain. Bond is in Venice because he found a glass vial connected to Drax's gambit. This is the time we learn of Holly's CIA association as well. He then does a sexism. What are you doing in Venice? I'm addressing a seminar of the European Space Commission. Well, heady stuff. But there again, I keep forgetting that you are more than just a very beautiful woman. Through stalking the glass company, Bond learns that Drax is going to use nerve gas to kill all of humanity. He also kills Chang and learns that Drax is moving his operations to Rio de Janeiro, where he goes, but not before Bond and Good had fuck, and not before he alerts MI6 to Drax's lab, resulting in another scene where I actually laughed. Frederick Gray, what a surprise. An indistinguished company all wearing gas masks. You must excuse me, gentlemen, not being English. I sometimes find your sense of humor rather difficult to follow. Bond goes to Rio via Concord, a beautiful yet heavily flawed aeroplane, much like this movie, and meets his contact during Carnival because of course. Yeah, Spectre did this better. Gee, this film is missing something. Something important. Something jazzy. It's Jaws! He's back, baby! Oh, by the way, he's working for Drax now. Forgot about that. <laughs> Bond and Goodhead finally team up for real and almost get killed by Jaws via cable car death. But this sets up Jaws's redemption arc. Jaws meeting Dolly is supposed to be played for laughs as she's ugly, but I, well, don't give a shit. Everyone deserves their own happiness, and if Jaws finds happiness with Dolly, then more power to him. Different people, different strokes. Now the world don't move to the beat of just one drum. Once in space, Drax explains his gambit, and through this, Bond manages to make Jaws realize that Drax would dispose of him and Dolly because they aren't perfect specimens. Bond and Goodhead disable the ship's cloaking device, thus resulting in the EPIC LASER FIGHT! The space station is destroyed, Jaws has his one line in the franchise, but gets rescued along with Dolly. Well. Here's to us. They live happily ever after. Bond and Good had fucking zero gravity. The end. Overall score, 4 out of 10. Only the last half hour is worth watching. It's epic. Other than that, it's just the spy who loved me. But worse! 
the basic plot. Bond is sent to find a British ship that mysteriously disappeared in the Mediterranean Sea. However, a young woman is also after that ship and is out for revenge! So, after the campiness of Moonraker, the people at Eon decided to make the best film of Era 2, for your eyes only. They wanted to return to basics because, come on, after you go to space, where else do you go? Broccoli even said, We were overcrowding the public on fantasy in outer space. I found it very boring too. It might suit somebody else, but it didn't have to be Bond. Everyone keeps on saying, when are you gonna do another Russia with love type thing? So we're trying the adventure, Hitchcockian sort of thing, full of suspense, excitement and thrills. It has the same vibe as the earlier Era 1 films, particularly from Russia with Love. It's down to earth, it's gritty, and it has the second best Bond girl of the era! Apparently though, Roger Moore didn't enjoy being a grittier action hero, to which I say... Different people, different strokes. But, as someone who goes to the cinema for EXISTENTIAL DREAD, I quite enjoyed it. It starts with a reference to On Her Majesty's Secret Service, with Bond laying flowers at the grave of his beloved Tracy. It's one of the few times this incarnation of Bond shows humanity, and it's a welcome change. After the grave marking, Bond is summoned by MI6 via helicopter to eliminate... Blofeld. We are told explicitly that this bald man with the white cat is Blofeld, mostly for legal reasons, but let's face it, it's Blofeld. Now, remember, in Era 1, Blofeld died in Diamonds Are Forever. Quite clearly, I might add. But here, Blofeld survived. Badly injured, but survived. Only for Bond to finally avenge his late wife's death by dropping him into a chimney. This scene is pointless, but it's entertaining and one of the reasons why I separate these films into eras by actor. We then get to the opening song. It has the same ethereal feeling and moody tone as Moonraker, but it fits this time because of the seriousness of the film. Say from having to watch Sheena Easton sing. Why did they have to show Sheena Easton sing? It's unnecessary. After the opening, the main conflict of the story is established. A British naval ship accidentally picks up a mine and drowns. A research ship is sent after it, holding one Timothy Havelock, his wife, and his daughter, Melina. Timothy and his wife are killed soon after by a Hector Gonzalez, right in front of Melina. She vows revenge, as you would in this situation. Seriously, she's justified in what she wants to do. She doesn't know why people wanted her parents dead. She doesn't know who hired Gonzalez to kill them. We also learn of the film's MacGuffin, the ATAC device. The ATAC, or Automatic Targeting Attack Communicator, is a system used by the British military to coordinate their naval submarines. The ATAC was in the ship that originally sank. I promise this will be important later, bear with me. My main gripe with this movie though, is that Melina is considerably younger than Bond. She's the second youngest Bond girl in the era, in fact. No, BB does not count. Roger Moore was 53 at the time of filming. Melina's actress, Carol Bouquet, was 23. Bond's age shows here, but it's partially an advantage. Why? Bond in this film seems to be resigned to the fact that he's getting older. He appears more world-weary, and this accords neatly with the identity of the literary Bond. To elaborate, the literary Bond was a cold, jaded anti-hero. He had little humor and did everything for queen and country. He had few friends and interests outside of work, but as time went by, especially after the death of Tracy, he became more and more of a broken man. If you want a sense of the literary accurate Bond, watch the Craig films. I will be talking about them in part two of this miniseries. So Bond is sent to Spain to see who hired Gonzalez, spying on him through some beautiful shots of the country until... Bond 
Richard stumbled into Gonzalez's sexy Spanish beach party, where he does criminal business in front of everyone. Bond is caught, though, and is held at gunpoint by Gonzalez's men. It's a breath of fresh air, in my opinion. Bond is captured in a manner that gives him no easy way out. Could he fight off the henchmen? He would get shot! Gonzalez took his gun! What can he do? That's right, bitches! We've got ourselves an archer! Well, a uh, crossbower, but still. Melina ends up getting her vengeance merely minutes into the movie, which is admirable, especially since Bond has only one kill at this point. However, it does hint at something larger afoot. It also gives Bond his chance to escape and for the funky soundtrack to really steal the- <laughs> ends up escorting Melina to safety just in time to see his burglar-proofed Lotus burst into flames. This allows for a well-shot car chase where the two converse without info dumping or reiterating things that we already know, all while riding in a shitty car past the Spanish valleys. My only complaint is what Bond says at the 30-minute mark. The Chinese have a saying, before setting out on revenge, you first dig two graves. This is a real saying, but the wording is wrong. In reality, it's before you embark on a journey of revenge, dig two graves. Bond is justifiably told off by MI6 for letting Gonzalez die, but Gonzalez doing business in front of everyone will ultimately lead to the destruction of whatever it is that's going on. Seriously, why would you do business like that in the open? Bond gets some intel from Q via the one gadget in the film, an AI face generator, then fucks off to Cortana to meet with another MI6 agent, Luigi Falala. There's nothing important to him, he dies later on. We also meet our main villain, Aristotle Christatos, played by Julian Glover. He's a properly menacing villain who's a borderline psychopath, and his gambit is the best in the entire era. In his first scene, we are told about a smuggler named Columbo. He doesn't appear until the second half, but I mention him now for good reason. Bond's conversation with Aristotle makes us believe that Columbo is evil and Aristotle is the ally. But in actuality, the roles are reversed. Aristotle is a chronic backstabber only interested in his own profits, while Columbo, played by the legendary Topol, is a chaotic good with his own moral code. Diamond, cigarettes, pistachio nuts, but no heroin. Sit down. That I leave to him. It's a subversion we don't normally get in a more Bond film, and it's a lovely change of pace. We also meet... Oh, good lord. So, this is BB Doll. She's a 16-year-old girl that is immediately attracted to Bond. She's a seemingly innocent figure skating prodigy, but she's the most sexual character in the film, resulting in a cringy but hilarious moment where she tries to woo Bond who, for all his flaws, would not engage in statutory rape. Well, I'm exceedingly flattered, BB, but you're in training. That's a laugh. Everybody knows it builds up muscle tone. Well, I'm not building up a little more muscle tone by putting on your clothes. Don't you like me? Fun fact! The day I did the notes for this part of the video, the wordle word of the day was nymph! Bond also rented to Melina again and is almost killed by a gang of motorcyclists. This leads to another moment of vulnerability for him, convincing Melina to return to Corfu while he tries to find out who hired Gonzalez. It shows Melina is merely a scared girl weighing over her head, and more Bond wanting to protect someone from a horrible fate. It can be read as him compensating for being unable to save Tracy, even if he didn't have any romantic feelings for Melina. The aforementioned BB scene happens, and Bond and BB have clean PG fun until Bond is almost killed by someone else in Aristotle's gang. He then finds Luigi dead with a dove pin in his hands. Because of this, Bond ends up killing someone in cold blood. It's an oddly intense scene in a more Bond film, and it wasn't something more particularly enjoyed doing and not something people thought he did well. 
Moore even admitted to it. If you read the internet blogs, people agree I was funny, but they're not so sure I was suave and certainly don't regard me as having been cold-blooded. There was one scene in For Your Eyes Only where I had to be rather cold-blooded in killing a villain. Uh, they say that scene changed your serious tone for my films, but I wasn't comfortable with it. Truth be known. Bond heads to Corfu, Bond and Melina, well, Bond, and finally team up as they are after the same thing. After a Baccarat scene, we finally meet Columbo and learn the gambit. Bond was played like a fiddle and Columbo was the good guy all along. Gonzales was hired by Aristotle to take the Havelocks out. Then, things get interesting. That I leave to him when he is not too busy working for Russia against my country and yours. At this point, remember, the Cold War was growing hotter, so it made sense at the time to say Aristotle was using the KGB to get the ATAC. Bond doesn't believe Columbo at first, so he takes him to an opium warehouse Aristotle runs, and lo and behold, the naval mines that sank the original ship are there. Bond and Melina, in a beautiful underwater scene, acquire the ATAC, only to be kidnapped by Aristotle and placed in a death trap similar to the one in the Live and Let Die novel. God, I love how capable Melina is. She isn't some sexy glamour girl or a damsel in distress, just a girl who wants to know what happened to her family. And character development happens. Bond talks Melina into not shooting Aristotle dead after he surrenders. Sure, Aristotle is killed anyway by Columbo, but that is justified given how much of a chronic backstabber Aristotle was. The ending, however, is bizarre. They had a Margaret Thatcher in person or play, quote, the Prime Minister, who is obviously Thatcher. Hell, she mentioned she has a husband named Dennis. It's Thatcher before she went to hell. Thatcher wants to personally thank Bond, but Bond is too busy fucking Melina, which... Okay, I get that's how the pre-Craig Bond films end, but this was unnecessary. Bond and Melina had no real romantic chemistry. To me, they seem nothing more than close friends, and close friends, they should stay. This film, while flawed, is the best of Era 2. I enjoyed it. Would I watch it again? Maybe, if someone was up for it. Overall score, 7.5 out of 10. A fun romp, albeit with weird shit thrown in. The best of the era. Melina was an iconic character. The basic plot. After a fake Fabergé egg is found on a killed double O agent, Bond is sent to investigate, leading him to an exiled Afghan prince, the mysterious gang leader Octopussy, and a plot to start World War III. You know what's great about you English? Octopussy. Man, I must have seen that movie twice. And twice was all the times I needed to see Octopussy in a lifetime. Out of all the Era 2 films, Octopussy was the one I remembered the least about when starting my notes. I knew there was a character named Octopussy, I knew the circus scene happened, but that's it. And there's a reason why. Octopussy is as bland as Margaret Thatcher's pussy. It's boring, it's predictable, my mind went on autopilot for most of it. So forgive me if I go total Wikipedia on y'all, I genuinely forgot what happens in this movie. It starts off with something we haven't seen in a while. A different double O agent! Don't get too attached, he doesn't last long. Just know he's holding a Fabergé egg and there's a reason why he's dressed as a total clown. Bond has a cold open with nothing to do with the plot. The last irrelevant cold open in the series. It involves a banana republic. I don't care. Moving on. We get to the opening song, All Time High. It's a pretty ballad and not seeing the singer is a lovely touch. Back to the plot at hand. 009, the other 00 agent, is killed by twin knife 
throwers, and Bond is called to the office. After the mandatory money penny scene with a one-off character I don't care about, we meet our new M, Robert Brown, aka Admiral Martin Hargreaves, probably. So now Bond has to go to an art auction to get a legit Fabergé egg. I have already lost track of what's happening. Is it the shit ton of Cabernet I'm drinking while watching? No, it's the Bond people who are wrong. We then see a Warsaw Pact meeting about NATO shit. One general wants to invade Europe, but another one rightfully says, no, that's a terrible idea, sit the fuck down, you asshole. This general is one of our main villains, General Orlov. He's a mad with power man who wants to conquer Western Europe. That's his deal. Woo. He is allied with Kamal Khan, an exiled Afghan prince played by an English actor? Come on! You had Indian actors for Indian characters! Was a Middle Eastern so hard to find? Anyway, we meet our white Asian prince and his henchwoman Magda. She'll be important later, I think. I actually don't remember. There were parts during this movie where I just paused, not to do anything important, but to try and figure out what was going on. My mind was so wiped out by the time I reached the 15 minute point of this film that everything was just going in one ear and out the other. Bond flexes on the art dealer MI6 brought in by saying that Kamal Khan needed the Fabergé egg and ends up stalking him to find out. He also snatched the real egg during the auction and replaced it with a fake what? Um, surprisingly believes Bond's claims and lets him fuck off to Delphi to properly stalk Khan Academy. I mean, Kamal, Kamal Khan. Yeah. God, remember Khan Academy? That takes me back to high school. We meet our contact through a clever use of the Bond theme. And then we see Magda again leaving the Octopussy boat. It's supposed to be a mystery at this point, but whenever you see an octopus in this film, just know whatever it's on is affiliated with Octopussy. We then get to a scene similar to the opening of Goldfinger, where our villain uses cheating to screw over a fellow hotel guest. This time, it's backgammon and Kamal is using loaded dice. Bond uses this against him, of course. The scene itself is well shot, and it shows Bond and Khan being socially introduced. Bond waging his egg is also entertaining. Khan's henchman even breaks the dice, just like Anja breaking the golf ball! Yeah, Goldfinger did this entire bit better, but still. Then we have a fight scene that is very... okay. Bond tossing rupees at people is funny though. Yeah. Rupee! We then finally see Q and his Indian Q branch. The snark is good, especially the dick joke. Last. Having problems keeping it up, Q? Q bugs Bond's egg and gives him an acidic pin. Bond also takes this time to be a perverted little shit. Hmm. Perfect image, Q. Really 007. Hopefully I won't get demonetized for that. Magda ends up whining and dining Bond to steal the real egg because of course she does, but as we've established, the egg is bugged now, so that's okay. Anyway, they fuck. It's just not Bond's cock that turns her good this time. Her octopusy tattoo, though, is an obvious fake. You can see the temporary lining. They didn't even try. Magda's performance, in general, is wooden. She seems to be reading her lines instead of acting them out. And as a result, she just sounds unmotivated. We then meet the titular character, the beautiful pussy gl- I mean octopussy, octopussy. She sounds familiar, but I can't put my finger on it right now. Bring him here. He's dangerous. After he's stalked, we must get rid of him immediately. No. It's clear, however, that octopussy is feared by Kamal, but why? To be honest, I don't know. I know how she got into the smuggling business and how she got so much power, but Kamal is a prince. Why is he so scared of her? 
Feels like I'm watching the AI remake of Goldfinger. Bond is then wined and dined by Khan, where he talks about everything he will do to him and, okay, Dr. No did this scene better. Even though it's much more racist, they did that scene better. In Dr. No, there's a sense of tension as we're finally learning the villain's gambit. It shows Dr. No as a foil of Commander Bond, a man who rejected his heritage and worked for the enemy, a man who adored the arts and just wanted to take over the world world with Bond. It just works. Bond uses his acid pen to escape Kamel Khan's luxury prison. He pervs on Magda for a bit before seeing Khan make nice with those dang dirty commies. Yep, Khan is in cahoots with General Orlov. Why? I don't know. At this point, I forgot about the Soviet subplot. <laughs> But alas, Khan learns the egg has been bugged, and our job, I mean Gobinda, traps Bond in a meat locker. We then get to what I call the Chase Glata Chassis, or the chase for chase's sake. Raymond Benson, once again, describes it best. It is painfully obvious that the filmmakers wanted to shoot a sequence involving a spectacular Indian tiger hunt, complete with elephants, Indians, and turbans, and the zoo of jungle animals. So a scene was written to accommodate. It's unnecessary for the advancement of the plots. In fact, it's damaging. There is no reason for this scene to exist. Bond could have been chased by Khan's guards and it would have had the same, if not better, effect. Bond getting a tiger to sit is... Funny, I guess, but this chase scene doesn't sit right with me. It feels somewhat racist, but that's the least of its problems. Anyway, Bond Tarzan yells, <coughs> escapes, and learns of Octopussy's Island. He's weird about it. That's the name I heard at Kamau's. I hear that island's full of beautiful women. No men allowed. Really? Sexual discrimination. I'll definitely have to pay it a visit. And then, finally, we see Octopussy emerging from the pool and... Oh my god, that's Maude Adams! The same person who played Andrea in The Man with the Golden Gun! Apparently, the producers felt bad about her lack of screen time in the latter film, so they made her the main Bond girl in this one. Was it worth it? Well, Octopussy being in her mid-30s is a lovely step away from more Bond's creepier couplings, and Adams plays the part of the dark femme well, but there's a context to her character that is missing if you haven't read the short story this film was named after. In the short story, Octopussy, Bond is sent to take Major Dexter Spythe into MI6 custody due to a murder involving Nazi gold. Bond doesn't immediately arrest Smythe, instead letting him contemplate his options. Smythe ends up committing suicide instead of facing a military trial. The film is meant to be kind of a follow-up to the short story, as Octopussy's real name is Octavia Smythe. She is Major Smythe's daughter, and is thankful that Bond let her father die with dignity. There's a problem with this, though. Few who watch the film have read the books. This reference will be lost on almost all of the moviegoers. Octopussy also reveals she's a cult leader? I guess. She's also a guest like Gatekeep Girl Boss. Good for her. Anyway, I got bored, so let me summarize the rest of the plot. Octopussy begins to support Bond, as does the rest of the Octopussy cult. Khan wants to put a nuclear bomb in a circus she is throwing in West Germany to start World War III. Why? I don't know. What does jewelry smuggling have to do with this? I don't know. After some more action scenes, we get to the greatest scene. Bond infiltrates the circus to disarm the bomb. How does he do this? Why tell you when I can show you as much as I can without getting copyrighted? There's a bomb in that cannon. Sure, where else would a bomb be? <laughs> Great clown, then. I'm deadly serious. I'm a British agent. What? For God's sake, tell him who I am. Kamal and Orloff double-crossed you. I saw them take the jewelry off the train. Does that convince you? 
Sir, that bomb is set to explode at 3.45. That's 90 seconds from now. General, this man's either drunk or crazy. Hey, raise that destroy the entire operation. India. Folks, we've had an emergency, but everything is all right now. You and your families are safe. Now please leave the tent in an orderly manner. This is a true testament to Moore's acting skills. This is a true testament to Moore's acting skills. It's a life or death situation, a dramatic bomb disarmament, and he has to do it dressed as a clown! It's absolutely glorious! It's a life or death situation, a dramatic bomb disarmament, and he has to do it all dressed as a clown! It's absolutely glorious! Khan kidnaps Octopussy, Bond saves her, Khan and Gobinda die, Bond and Octopussy fuck, the end. Overall score, 3.8 out of 10, mostly boring. Has a few good scenes, I wish we got to see more of the Octopussy cult. The basic plot. Bond is sent after Zorin Industries after a computer chip of theirs is found in Siberia. Through this, he learns of the CEO's plan to take over Silicon Valley, and thus, the world! And now, we get to the final film of Era 2, a movie so gay, yet so bad. Okay, confession. My copy of Raymond Benson's book only goes up to Octopussy. I know there's a second edition that covers all the 80s Bond films, but I broke it, I don't want another copy. But there are still some things you should know before we continue. Metro Goldwyn Meyer merged with, though essentially bought, United Artists in the 80s. Octopussy was actually the first to be released post merger, but the merger proper was especially notable in the production of this film. At the time of A View to a Kill's production, MGM was going through an executive shuffle and ended up hardballing Broccoli on the film's funding. John Glenn, who directed all the 80s Bond films, recounted, It progressively got worse. MGM brought some pretty rough characters in. They came over and gave Cubby a hard time. That I really thought was bad. A man that deserved so much respect was treated with so little respect. They were hatchet men. They had a brief to cut us down to size at the time they were in a disparate plight financially. With United Artists, Cubby had carte blanche. We were all responsible people, and these people knew that. When MGM came in, I can imagine a conversation where someone would say, We are not spending these millions. We've got to cut down. At this point, none of the Bond films were unprofitable, and the most expensive Bond film at the time was Moonraker at 34 million in 1979 money. Remember, Moonraker was the highest grossing movie in the franchise until GoldenEye! It should also be noted that by this point, 
Fleming's original material was starting to run dry. All of the novels Sans Casino Royale had been adapted in some way, and aside from the short stories, there was nothing left. Michael G. Wilson, who co-wrote the screenplay, said as such in 1985. For all practical purposes, we've been out of material for the past five films. We will bring in the occasional Fleming element from the books, which haven't been used in the films. But that's not much help when you get down to basic plotting. The crew did their best with what they had, and the end result was garbage. Let's find out how. The film starts with a disclaimer. Yes, a disclaimer reading. Neither the name Zorin nor any other name or character in this film is meant to portray a real company or actual person. Apparently, there was an actual tech company named Zorin, so they were kind of forced to add this disclaimer to get any and all lawyers off their hide. And then, we see something we haven't seen in a while. A cold open that's relevant to the plot! Here, Bond is sent to coldest Siberia to recover a microchip from a deceased agent. 003. The scene is well shot and John Barry's grandiose soundtrack only adds to its epicness. And as a welcome change from hearing the standard Bond theme, Bond gets the chip, escapes, and... I might be the only one here who thinks this, but why did they switch to a rock song here? It completely changes the mood of the scene and not for the better. They switch back after a couple minutes too, so the change doesn't really make sense. Bond gets to his secret hideaway and good lord! Roger Moore was 56 when this movie was filmed. From my understanding, that's the oldest a Bond actor ever was during his tenure. But Jesus, Moore's age shows in this film. And that's the main problem I have with A View to a Kill. We've already seen Bond do these cool things in his 30s and 40s, but he's doing these same things in his 50s. It's weird, especially since Moore doesn't look like the kind of dude who would be doing all that at 56. It would have worked if it was about Bond decaying and not being able to do all the things he used to do, but Eon won't do that until much later. Before you say I'm being too harsh, Moore himself shared similar sentiments. He already almost quit before For Your Eyes Only, and later said he was 400 years too old to play Bond. He was also uncomfortable being paired with young women half his age, and admitted he should have left the franchise earlier. Bond then fucks a 27-year-old woman, and we get to the theme. This theme, A View to a Kill by Duran Duran, is the first since Live and Let Die to be done by an actual band. It's a solid bop that sets up the gayness we are to experience later, and was the highest performing Bond film at its debut until Writings on the Wall. No, Skyfall by Adele did not reach number one in the US or the UK. Leave me alone. We then return to England for our final scene with Louis. Maxwell's Money Penny. It's nothing special, but it's bittersweet as they recast her for Era 3. We then learn the gambit. Elon Musk wannabe Max Zorin wants to destroy Silicon Valley to have a monopoly on chips, along with the most iconic henchwoman of the era. So, does this gambit sound familiar? Yeah, it's basically Goldfinger with silicon chips instead of gold. I get it, they were running out of stuff to use, but considering how often Era 2 departed from Fleming source material, couldn't they have used a different Fleming book, like the original Moonraker? Just saying. Also like Goldfinger, there's a scene where we meet the villain in a posh setting. This time, it's at a horse racing event, but we also meet. Under the hat, with a red dress. Girlfriend? Oh. Yeah, we're not sure about her. Mayday! 
Hey, this chick is the gay icon we've been waiting for. She's played by Grace Jones, who was already a queer icon for her androgynous appearance and amazing progressive music. The character is also by... Maybe. They don't outright say it, but she's probably bi. Then we go to Paris just to see Mayday kill someone. It's wonderfully shot, but pointless in the long run as Bond meets Zorin in the next scene. Couldn't MI6 just hook him up with a meeting? Why did they make him meet someone in Paris? Sorry, I'm nitpicky. <laughs> But I think the reason I'm being nitpicky is because there is little to the plot. There is little here that we haven't seen already. Brockley and Moore admitted to it, even. But the latter didn't seem to mind much. Let's face it, there's a sameness about James Bond that you can't escape. And there are certain threats that continue to keep Bond going. The films are exactly as a child wanting to hear a bedtime story and if you change a word or leave out a few lines because you think he's fallen asleep or you're bored and you want to go to bed yourself, look out. We want the comfort of the sameness. Hell, I had to watch this film multiple times, but there's little I can say without sounding like a broken record. So I'll stop. Overall score, 2 out of 10. It's bad. Bad, bad, bad. The only redeeming parts were the music and Grace Jones. But you'll have a better time listening to Grace Jones's music instead. Roger Moore officially announced his retirement from the franchise in December of 1985, about six months after A View to a Kill's premiere. He appeared in other films prior to his death, none too significant for me to bring up. He did a lot of humanitarian work too. He became a UNICEF Goodwill ambassador in 1991 after being inspired by his friend, fellow actress and humanitarian Audrey Hepburn. However, he never truly left the James Bond circle, writing a book about his experiences and thoughts on the franchise. I recommend it if you're a fan of his or of Bond, but if not, it's not worth it. He also voiced opinions on newer Bond developments, Allegedly! saying Bond should only be a white man to preserve the integrity of the character. I've heard people talk about how there should be a lady Bond or a gay Bond, but they wouldn't be Bond for the simple reason that there wasn't what Ian Fleming wrote. It is not about being homophobic or for that matter racist, it is simply about being true to the character. What can I say but shut the fuck up bro? By the way, I say allegedly because the main source for this was Daily Mail. And we all know they are to be taken with a grain of salt. He also went to Crown Prince Frederick and Mary's wedding in 2004, apparently weird. But alas, Moore passed away on May 23rd, 2017, just five months shy of turning 90. And... Phoenix would rise again just two years later, thus beginning part two of this special. But that doesn't mean we're done yet today. Hi! Uh, so you might be wondering why I am doing this in essentially pitch darkness. Well, not exactly pitch darkness, I have my phone <laughs> off the camera as like my one light. Let me explain real quick. Today was going to be the day I wanted to film this scene. So I got on my costume, put on the accessories, and right when I was about to finish the look, there was a fucking microburst. Or a downburst, I do not 100% remember. So anyway, uh, we have a power outage and it's been going on for a while. My energy company said the power would be restored by 8.30 tonight. It is currently about nine o'clock, no power. And they sent me another email about 20 minutes ago saying it would not be restored until 10 a.m. tomorrow. Well, I can't just wear this costume for the rest of the night. <laughs> so, as a form of personal rebellion, I'm just going to take care of it right now. Please be sure to give a big fuck you to in the comments for making me have to pull this bullshit on y'all. Yeah! 
Anyway, let's travel back to 1983, the only other year with two Bond films. How? Well, the answer starts with Kevin McClory and ends with Kevin McClory. It was Kevin McClory. <laughs> Remember how I said McClory retained the Thunderball film rights after that lawsuit in the 60s? And how he refused to give them up even when Eon went DEFCON 1 on all Bond stuff outside their control? After his legal moratorium on making his own Thunderball expired, McClory worked to make his own Thunderball adaption, even going to court to retain sole rights to Spectre and Blofeld. But there's a twist! McClory got Sean Connery himself to return as James Bond. And Connery sounded optimistic about the performance. I was discussing the screenplay with my wife. She said, well, if it's going so well, why don't you play the part? And coming from her, I gave it more thought than I normally would, I suppose. It seemed quite a good idea after all these years. In 1978, Paramount bought the rights to the film, and all seemed to be going well. Until Eon and United Artists went to court against them. Thus, Paramount got cold feet and bailed. Years passed, and McClory's pet project seemed doomed. Until he reconciled with an old friend named Jack Schwartzman. Schwartzman was as a producer and former attorney who picked up the film without second thought. So it was decided the film would be produced independently. They eventually got Warner Bros. on board as a distribution partner and got Ivan Kirshner of Star Wars fame to direct. However, the film's production itself was troubled. To avoid further legal action, the screenplay was written to stay as close to the original 50s script as possible, and not the Thunderball book. The screenplay itself went through numerous rewrites with edits being done during filming. Connery had to sign off on everything, from the casting to the music. And what didn't help was that Connery and Schwartzman did not get along. Two of the film's co-writers, Dick Clement and Ian Lafrenat, have been very open about the filming process and elaborated on the production. There was a lot of paranoia around the set because the crew was terrified of being sued by Broccoli. At one time, we were told we could shoot only the dialogue that is in the original novel. They started shooting before they were ready, and the film was definitely not ready to shoot. We were in the position of plumbers fixing a bad leak. We had to be aware of the logistics and the politics, as well as the writing. Was the trouble worth it? Is the film better than Thunderball? Or worse? Let's find out. One quick note, though. Even though this is Connery's seventh time playing James Bond, I will be treating this film as a separate continuity from the Eon films. This film has its own lore for the character and MI6 bureaucracy, and it's not worth the effort to try and link this back to Era 1 Bond. The film immediately gives you an 80s vibe, with Lena Hall singing the very synthesized main theme. The music itself is one of the low points of the film. It was done by the late Michel Legrand, who is not at all untalented. He won numerous rewards and did scores for movies like Ice Station Zebra and 1970's Wuthering Heights. But he decided to incorporate his talent at jazz piano into the film, making some of the scenes tonally inconsistent. The opening itself establishes our main character, Sean Connery Bond, as he's engaging in a routine training exercise. They weren't able to use the glandiose opening credits or gun barrel sequences for obvious reasons, but the intro works. Maybe it's because the only other Bond film that utilizes this opening style to an extent is Die Another Day, and we all know how good that was! <laughs> Bond fails this exercise, and we get to the differences in this canon, which give me some vibes of the earlier Craig films. This MA6 is more technocratic, with a new M who has little use for double O agents like Bond. It reminds me of the themes of decay and change in Skyfall, to be honest, and from the screenwriters who talked, that seemed to be the intent. The main thing is that Connery was a little older 
but he's still the quintessential Bond. We weren't trying to reinvent him at all. But you get reminded that this is just a film when shit like this happens. Tactical revolutionaries kidnap a millionaire's daughter and hold her captive for eight weeks. Of course, she could have been brainwashed. Wait, is that a reference to Patty Hearst? I do enjoy Connery's portrayal of Bond here. He's still snarky, confident, and seems to be in much better shape than he was in Diamonds Are Forever. And his visit to the health clinic is given a reason too! Emma's pissed at him for being old and decadent and wants him to get in shape. And Bond's sexual encounter with the nurse here is explicitly consensual! The nurse is genuinely interested in him and he sweetens the deal with gourmet food. Another compliment I'll give this film is Blofeld, played by the late Max von Sydow. He plays the role of the menacing posh villain well and it's a shame that not only is this his only appearance as Blofeld, but they caught me! of his scenes! This is the best betrayal of Blofeld in the 20th century and they gave him nothing! I'm not the only one that thinks that, by the way. There are people who wanted Van Saito to play Blofeld in an official film, but sadly, that was not meant to be. The gambit in Never Say Never Again makes more sense too. In Thunderball, they killed an Air Force pilot and gave a Spectre Man plastic surgery to look like him. In Never Say Never Again though, the sexy Fatima Bush gives the USAF pilot a heroin addiction and brainwashed him. Speaking of the pilot, his sister, main Bond girl Domino, is given more development as well. Here, she's played by Kim Basinger of Calamity, I mean Hollywood fame. She has hobbies of personality and genuinely seems to love Largo, thus giving her a character arc surrounding his betrayal of her. Oh, and can we talk about Fatima? She is iconic. She is so hammy, hot-tempered, and I want her to step on me. And she has somewhat of an obsession with Bond bordering on psychotic. She's amazing. There's not much I can say about the plot. It's literally just an updated version of Thunderball with some improvements. The only other things of note are that Mr. Bean is in it. Well, Rowan Atkinson, but still. They cast a black man as Felix Leiter, Bernie Cassie, and two decades before Jeffrey Wright. And at the halfway point, Bond plays an Atari game. It's weird and it seemed like they were trying too hard to be cool. The film itself is... Okay, it's better than Thunderball and Octopussy, but it's not world changing. Ironically enough, Broccoli was cool with the movie. There was one instance where the dailies for Never Say Never Again were given to him during the filming of Octopussy, and he sent it to its proper place as fast as possible. When Tom Mankiewicz declined to write for Never Say Never Again due to his loyalty to Eon, Broccoli later told him that he would have been fine with them partaking in the rival film. The fun of the movie comes with what happened after. The film did turn a profit, but not as much as Octopussy. McClory was undeterred though, and announced plans for a sequel! But then, Sean Connery declined an offer to do the sequel. The troubled production turned himself off plans on doing a Bond film again, and McClory's plan for the sequel fell through. In 1997, things seemed to look up for McClory as he teamed up with Sony Pictures, who, after purchasing Columbia, had the Casino Royale rights to make a new Thunderball movie. However, MGM took Sony to court over this, resulting in the aforementioned settlement where MGM got the Casino Royale rights and Sony got the Spider-Man rights. McClory tried to continue his case against MGM to make a Bond film, but it was rejected. McClory died in 2006, less than a week after the release of Eon's proper Casino Royale adaption. MGM and Eon had continued legal battles with McClory's estate until 2013, when the latter relinquished the rights to Spectre and Blofeld, thus allowing the organization to make a proper return to the franchise. But more on that later. In all honesty though, McClory's life was a tragedy. He was capable of great things. He could have been a very successful producer, but he wasted it all on a petty feud that ultimately led to little more than a film forgotten by the general population. If he had just walked away and found his own film passions outside of Bond, God knows what he could have made. And there you have it, ladies. 
gentlemen, and those in between and out of the binary, we have made it past 14 Bond films, plus change. I think it's clear now that James Bond changed in his first 20 years of life, from a suave but flawed character to a one-dimensional shell of a man. But stay with us. The darkness will return. The phoenix will be reborn. I will be back.